We have not been afforded an opportunity to combat or contradict Mr. Stoughton's proposed testimony in that regard, in addition to it being outside the scope of what he would normally testify to, at least in this particular case. Um, so, Your Honor, I do believe that um, you know, bringing in a sixth opinion, this was the very nature of the motion in limine at the beginning of the case, and this is what we sought to prevent. And, and the court gave latitude uh, with respect to Sergeant Pluger, with respect to uh, Lieutenant Zimmerman, um, with respect to allowing the chief to testify as to his interpretation of Minneapolis police policy. Um, so at this point, and we have an expert witness who the state introduced, Sergeant Steiger, who has already performed this exact same analysis. It's cumulative, it's <laughs> it just builds and builds and builds, and it was the very nature of what we sought to, to prevent. Who would like to speak for the state? Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the state strongly opposes defendant's motion to uh, exclude the testimony of expert uh, witness Seth Stoughton. Uh, as the as we've uh, explained to the court in our memorandum of law, Mr. Stoughton, Professor Stoughton, comes at the use of force issue in a much different way than the other witnesses who have testified. That he is a, a nationally recognized expert, he is an academic, and he takes an academic approach. He would not be uh, pursuant to the court's direction commenting on MPD policies or analyzing those, but rather the national standards and generally accepted police practices. And this is an important distinction because, uh, as the court knows, the defendant is not on trial for violating policies. He's on trial for violating the law. And uh, a department can have a policy that's uh, improper. A department can have a training that's improper, but it doesn't make it reasonable. And Professor Stoughton can speak to that. There's a national standard under Graham versus Connor. There's a standard uh, of generally accepted police practices and all of those fit into the constellation of what uh, in, is objective reasonableness as viewed as a reasonable police officer on the scene. Uh, well, Sergeant Steiger spoke to Graham factors and the chief spoke to Graham factors. Um, why do we need yet another person to talk about the Graham factors? Your Honor, because he comes from a completely different perspective and I think it's important to first focus on you know, when we're looking at exclusion, it'd be under Minnesota Rule uh, 403, cumulative evidence that would be unduly cumulative, right? That would be unfairly cumulative, unnecessarily so. So you have to look at the importance of the relevant evidence here. The use of force or authorized use of force is a complete defense to all of the charges in this case. And so it is uh, primary. It's at front and center. It's important uh, that we counter what is sort of the Goldilocks uh, syndrome in viewing expert witnesses. This witness is too old. This witness is just an administrator. This witness is uh, you know, not a national expert. This witness hasn't testified uh, as an expert witness before. Right? We, in order to be able to convince the jury, and we do have the sole burden of proof of doing so, that the use of force here was unauthorized, and was objectively unreasonable, we need to come at it in a variety of ways. And Professor Stoughton uh, is able to complete the last piece of that as through the eyes of a nationally recognized expert. So uh, what would he say? Let, let's get more specific. What, what specifically would Professor Dr. Stoughton say? What, what he will testify is that is upon evaluating both the, uh, the uh, threat or lack thereof posed by Mr. Floyd uh, at the scene uh, to, the, uh, to the defendant and the other officers, both in terms of their own safety and thwarting uh, law enforcement purposes. Right? Based on that and based on nationally recognized uh, best practices and police standards, the use of force here was objectively unreasonable. And he analyzes it both using Graham versus Connor, but in a, in a four-part analysis where he identifies uh, the force being used. He identifies uh, the circumstances under which the force is used and the duration of the force. 
it looks at the effect, the, you know, the, the effect of the force used by the officers as compared with sort of the, the uh, threat uh, posed by the uh, subject and then makes a determination whether that is, uh, action was objectively reasonable under the circumstances. And so, you know, it integrates Graham versus Connor, but it goes about it in a different manner, and it speaks to national and best practices standards. And it's important testimony, and it's a testimony that's, that's central to the case. Are, is your plan to show yet again the videos? certain segments of videos that are already in evidence as demonstrative, and these are very limited in duration, Your Honor. I'm not having him play through an entire video and uh, comment on each and every thing. What he is going to be doing is in the same manner in which he analyzes and reviews cases. So, you know, the, the threat, for example, or lack thereof posed by Mr. Floyd. He would be talking about specific segments of the video that he thought were key to his analysis for that. And we'd select those, and they're five second clip, eight second clip, uh, not an extended play. And then going through the next portion of the analysis uh, in an, in an, and also commenting on whether or not uh, the bystanders would have had an effect on a reasonable officer, we highlight certain portions of those clips too. In a, not necessarily chronological order, but in an, but in a you know in an orderly fashion. Uh, I expect that his testimony won't last and on direct more than 90 minutes, uh, so it's not going to be exhaustive play of this. Now, that's important because having read the report of the defense expert, uh, Barry Broad, who is expected to testify, um, central to his report is that the crowd so distracted uh, the defendant that he was unable to render aid and perform the normal duties that he would as a law enforcement officer. And so it's important to that issue as well, and that's an issue that's been certainly raised and suggested uh, by the defense uh, throughout this trial. All right. Well, the court's concern was pretty clear before, is that in motions eliminated, that so we're not going to call every cop and ask him, what would you have done differently? And basically, I think the state has almost done that. Uh, we now have opinions from the chief, the inspector who was in charge of training, the lieutenant who was in charge of training, Lieutenant Zimmerman because of his seniority and that he was the responding lieutenant on the scene, the sergeant. Uh, I think the state has made its own bed here by deciding to ask all those people what their opinion was as opposed to sticking with their experts. Uh, so I think the defense has a legitimate Concern, and I have a concern that uh, this is becoming cumulative. Um, as far as use of force, since it is more from an academic point of view and national standards, I'll allow you to call Dr. Stoughton to talk about national standards and how the use of force here violated them. Uh, I'm not going to allow you to do the, uh, the crowd effect on his opinion. That's, it's, it's really pushing the extremes of his expertise. He's the use of force expert. Uh, he can mention that he didn't think the crowd in this case was, but he's not going to get into uh, was a factor. He's aware of it. He didn't think it was a factor, and he can give an opinion as to whether or not the defendant violated national standards. But I don't want him getting into separate opinions about generally the existence of crowds. And uh, he can talk about he's aware in this case about the crowd effect, and that does not change his opinion. But we're not getting into small crowds, large crowds. This is how you would deal with large crowds. I don't want to get into that again. It, <clears throat> to the extent the defense, I'm probably giving more than the state deserves by allowing you to talk about national standards and his opinion in this case, whether they were violated. And he can talk about how the crowd, he took the crowd into effect. But I don't want him talking about like some of the experts did about small crowds, large crowds, all that. The specific crowd. Exactly. I will uh, limit it to his uh, this specific uh, this specific crowd this specific event. He's, yeah. We're going to be looking at the specific uh, events here, not hypotheticals, just the timeline, his examples, and then his opinions. All right, uh, Your Honor. As to the uh, uh, phenomena of auditory pareidolia, uh, as the uh, supplemental uh, report that we gave to the defense, this is raised by the uh, questioning of both uh, uh, expert Jody Steiger 
and of lead investigator James Ryerson, in which the defense uh, introduced it would exhibit 1007, I believe, and asked uh, witnesses to opine based on what uh, he first suggested uh, that Mr. Floyd said. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Stoughton, because he reviews so many you know, body-worn camera cases and has an expertise in that and has uh, you know, lectured uh, on this topic before of the phenomenon of suggestibility or auditory, uh, auditory pareidolia, he would be able to provide not only a testimony about the suggestibility and why a witness may have answered a question in a particular way, he would be able to provide an example of this. We have a demonstrative of that particular segment slowed down, supplemented with a transcript, uh, and uh, it would suggest he said something completely different. Ultimately, Professor Stoughton would indicate that when he listened to the portion uh, several times without suggestion, he was unable to discern what precisely was said. Mr. Nelson, you want to respond to that part, since I don't think we talked much about that. Uh, Your Honor, again, I believe that this is within the province of the jury to decide what was said. The state has already, after I asked those questions of Mr. Ryerson, they took Agent Ryerson into the hall, he listened, and he formed a different opinion about what was said. Um, and so, first and foremost, this is an issue within the province of the jury. What was said, what wasn't said, they can listen to it. They're going to be provided with uh, the exhibits in this particular case. Um, so it is uh, within their province, not the expertise for him to come in. It's also important, I think, Judge, that the exhibit that they have intended to, or they've provided me that they intend to offer, is a very slowed down with um, subtitles uh, showing what they believe or they think it could potentially be saying or could be interpreted as saying. So. Again, we've not had any opportunity uh, within the last 48 hours to analyze what it is that they've done, to have an expert to combat it, or to have anybody. Uh, this was completely um, out of left field, in my opinion. So, and given the court's previous orders on expert witnesses, I mean, what the state has done throughout the course of this case is they've introduced segments. They've attributed statements to various witnesses where certain things, you don't know if it's Officer King saying something, you don't know if it's Officer Lane saying something. You know, the jury's not had the, op we're, the jury's just being told by the state, this is who's saying this. So um, it's the defense's right to uh, introduce doubt and, uh, and at this point, the late, the late hour on it is Problematic. Well, on top of which, I think it, it's a very much a collateral issue, but um, I'm going to grant the request to exclude that testimony. It's not a proper topic for expert testimony. Uh, the video is what it is. The jury can listen to it. They can make up their own mind. In fact, to be honest, I was surprised that there was not an objection when Mr. Nelson asked uh, the witness, is, isn't he saying X, Y, and Z? That's an, a witness opining on, a, on a, a videotape telling the jury what they should see or hear. And that's not a proper topic for expert testimony. And the fact that you had to slow it down and use subtitles, I think, is just an indication that um, this is not a proper topic. It's for the jury to decide. They can listen to it. I mean, I have experience in listening to a lot of body-worn cameras. That doesn't make me an expert. Um, I have to make factual findings off and off of body-worn cameras in Rasmussen hearings doesn't make me an expert, nor is it appropriate that I, I would, uh, when I sit listening to body-worn cameras, I'm doing so as a finder of fact, just like this jury should. So they're going to have to listen to it on their own. They're going to have to figure it out. Both sides can argue. And both sides got their point across anyway. Agent Ryerson said, yeah, it does say I eat too many drugs. And on redirect said, putting it in context, I think it was I ain't do any drugs. So both sides have had their say. Um, which probably was better off in closing. But in any case, you're not going to be allowed to ask him about that stuff. Other motions we had, I think. Uh, we have Mr. Hall. We're going to deal with Mr. Hall, uh, put him on the stand, and have him either invoke or, and for me to determine whether or not to each specific question, if it's an appropriate invocation or not. 
uh, but we're doing that tomorrow, I believe. And, but for now, the question is, assuming Mr. Hall does not answer any questions, refuses either on Fifth Amendment grounds or just refuses the court's order, uh, what, is, what did you wish to introduce, Mr. Nelson, and what's the basis for admissibility? Um, Your Honor, the, um, Mr. Hall provided an interview to Agent Doug Henning of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and Agent Ricky Worry of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. After um, the incident on May 25th, Mr. Hall um, left the state of Minnesota, returned to Texas, uh, was ultimately apprehended based on um, some warrants that existed, was apprehended in the state of Texas, and Agents Henning and Worry uh, traveled to Texas to interview him. At that time, um, the I would note that Mr. Hall had a an attorney who was present uh, and was um, giving him advice as to providing statements about this particular incident. Um, the statement that he provided included just to give context of, of uh, the statement. The statement was approximately an hour and a half long. Um, he freely answered the agent's questions about where he and Mr. Floyd spent the day, what his behavior, what their behaviors were, where they went, the things that they did earlier in the day, um, and specifically how he appeared physically, what his demeanor was, etc. cetera. Um, he then provided information to Mr. Uh, excuse me, Agents Henning and Worry uh, relevant to being in cup foods, his observations of Mr. Floyd in cup foods, and his observations of Mr. Floyd in the car prior to uh, the arrival of Officers King and Lane. Um, he, what Mr. Hall described was that instantaneously, it was, as it was day and night difference essentially um, in his behavior, he fell asleep, um, he was, um, they were concerned, they didn't understand why they weren't driving. Then all of this, in, in, he describes the interaction with the two witnesses who've previously testified, uh, the store employees who've testified. He describes that um, they had to try to shake Mr. Floyd awake several times. Um, and then obviously he gives testimony about what happened afterwards. There were questions about whether, by the agents, about whether Mr. Hall had, uh, excuse me, Mr. Floyd had consumed any uh, substances, controlled substances. Um, Mr. Hall opined that that was, at least in part, what was going on. Um, he had discussions about, with Mr. Floyd, about how these particular pills made him feel and um, largely attributes his falling asleep to taking these pills. Um, oh, in, he, that, in that statement, did Mr. Hall admit that he had provided those drugs to Mr. Floyd? No, he was specifically asked that question by the agents. Did you give him these uh, pills? And he said, no, that was his response. Okay. Um, and so uh, and then he obviously goes on to describe what happens after the officers arrived and the initial detainment and his interactions with Peter, Ch uh, Peter Chang of the Minneapolis Park Police. And so he paints a picture of what was happening before the incident, immediately preceding the incident, and as the incident was occurring. And so, and what reactions were happening. Um, so we would offer, uh, if Mr. Hall invokes uh, his blanket or a blanket sort of uh, invocation of the Fifth Amendment, um, Your Honor, I believe first and foremost, the court has to analyze the defendant's, Mr. Chauvin's, right to present a complete defense and the, the constitutional law that stems from the right to present a complete defense when it contradicts with another person or conflicts with another person's right against self-incrimination. Um, I also believe that Mr. Chauvin has a right to confront any witnesses that would be uh, uh, available to him, and including trying to build his defense through those types of witnesses. Number three, the state has uh, gone to great lengths to establish that fentanyl or controlled substances have not played, did not play a role in Mr. Floyd's death. 
Um, and the state is the only uh, uh, party to this that has the ability to offer Mr. Floyd immunity, uh, use immunity. Well, the court can't order it, I can't request it, but they have, uh, at least in the chamber's discussions, stated that they do not intend to offer Mr. Hall immunity for his statements. Um, so I think the state would have to make a showing or an offer of proof as to why they are not intending to offer uh, Mr. Hall use immunity at a very minimum use immunity of this statement. Um, and the specific grounds or what we would propose uh, is similar to what the, the court did in State versus Super, S-U-P-E-R, and I can get the site for you in a second. And in State versus Super, it was a similar circumstance where uh, the defendant was charged with premeditated first degree murder. A witness uh, invoked her Fifth Amendment privileges. Uh, the, the state refused immunity. And ultimately, um, the court, what the court permitted, was playing the witness's statement uh, in court to the jury. So, playing the audio of the witness's statement. Uh, and that's what we would be proposing is to call Agent Henning to uh, come in, explain the circumstances of the, uh, of the interview, to play portions of the inter interview that are ruled appropriate by the court. And um, we would offer those under uh, Minnesota Rule of Evidence 804B3, which is a statement against penal interest, or 807, which is the residual exception, which is what the court used in the super case was the residual exception. Well, Stop you there. 804b3, the statement inherently has to clearly subject the person to such that the person who's making the statement knows that they are throwing themselves in the soup, so to speak. Understood. And as you heard um, from Miss uh, Cousins, I believe, uh, Adrian Cousins, Mr. Hall's lawyer here, um, the third degree homicide charge is uh, a potential charge that Mr. Hall could face if he specifically uh, provided, exchanged, bartered, or had any knowledge of what was, of what was going on. You, the court has now also seen the evidence of Mr. Hall throwing, uh, throwing what appears to be some package uh, off to his side while the police were dealing with Mr. Floyd. So if you look at the circumstances of this statement, I mean, the it would certainly be, if he were to be charged, it would certainly be a statement about what was happening in that car. And circumstantially, and at, at a, from a ba bare minimum, it would be impeachment if he were to get up and testify that he uh, didn't provide Mr. Floyd with the controlled substances. So, I mean, the, for, according to Mr. Hall's uh, public defender, even acknowledging his presence or that that was him in the video or that was him with Mr. Floyd on that date, um, certainly, uh, certainly uh, could potentially tend to incriminate him. That's, I mean, they say everything about this case, uh, about his testimony, could incriminate him. Well, but, are you saying that the, the testimony that would be, that he could legitimately refuse to answer on Fifth Amendment grounds and the evidence that's admissible under 804b3 are the same? Yes. The same universe? Okay. Because, I mean, ultimately, Judge, this, this um, you, if you look at the, the sum total, when Mr. Hall made this statement, right, which was June 2nd of 2020, so within a week, uh, he was located and apprehended and interviewed. He was counseled by a competent attorney who, um, Gave, gave the blessing to speak about what happened to Mr. Floyd on that day. But if you go back out and you look at, there were pills found in the car, there's a video of him throwing something, there are uh, above, and beyond, above and beyond just the third degree controlled substance crimes, they do ask him questions about giving false identification. He gave two different, he gave Officer Lane uh, the an actual driver's license or ID card with someone's name on it. He then gave Peter Chang a secondary name. So he can be incriminating himself. Did he admit all that in the statement? He did. Okay. 
He, um, he had warrants uh, for his arrest that were in place at that time, issued by the state of Minnesota. And he explains in that statement that, that he has had problems with the warrants, which is why he took off out of town. Um, that's ultimately why he was apprehended as well. So he had, um, he had multiple layers of, he acknowledges uh, in the statement having a counterfeit $20, bill in, $20 bill in his possession. So in the course of this statement, he makes several incriminating statements outside of this particular incident. As it pertains to whether he provided Mr. Floyd with the drugs, he denies it, right? I mean, he says, I didn't do it. And, you know, if, if that is his position, based on how this, the, the questions that the state has presented, they intend to impeach him if he were to testify in this case with that statement. I mean, so they're using some of the very things that he claimed in his statement to either impeach him or to attack his credibility. Uh, so certainly, I, I think that the state has taken the position that, that Mr. Paul's testimony or his statement was not credible to these investigators. Um, they have the ability to, again, <laughs> offer him use immunity um, in, if, they're, if, if that is uh, uh, their position that the controlled substance had played no part in this case. So, you know, when we look at, again, a defendant has a right to present a complete defense. And so when we start from that analysis, that would include ex in, uh, investigation of facts that are exculpatory or that are consistent with his defense. And that's what this is. We look at the residual exception in, in terms of uh, the 807, in terms of the trustworthiness of this statement. There are several aspects of this statement that are corroborated by Ms. Shawanda Hill. So particularly when describing um, Mr. Floyd's reaction in the car, she also describes uh, that um, Mr. Floyd fell asleep in the car and was, they had a very difficult time waking him up, so much so that she called her daughter to come and pick her up. She makes statements about um, Mr. Floyd taking Percocets. So there is, above and beyond that, Mr. Hall was counseled by his attorney about this case and giving this statement. So, well, let, and let me just, and maybe this is an argumentative question, although uh, well, I don't mean it to be. So you're saying that his lawyer who was advising him at the time of his statement advised his client to give a statement that was so far uh, contrary to his penal interests that uh, it's admissible under 804B3? Well, I mean, to that end, the lawyer was a Texas lawyer and may not have been a familiar with Minnesota's third degree homicide statute. Fair enough. All right, who from the state would like to answer? Mr. Frank. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, as I, well, I think the court clearly sees that uh, sort of the conflict that counsel is presenting here in saying that uh, there are issues that Mr. Hall can testify about legitimately despite a Fifth Amendment claim, and yet those s same uh, statements um, are not what establish the um, the trustworthiness that the statement against interest requires. Uh, in other words, counsel is saying Mr. Hall made statements against his interest, but those are not the statements he's trying to have Mr. Hall testify about. The statements he wants Mr. Hall to testify about um, that he has asked the court to allow despite the invocation of the Fifth Amendment are not the statements against interest. To step back just a minute, counsel argues that he has a, a constitutional right to present a defense. That's true, but the state the, there are tons of cases that recognize that's true, but defendants still have to follow the rules of evidence. The rules of evidence, the hearsay rules, um, have to be satisfied for the statements that counsel wants to come in through Mr. Hall, despite a Fifth Amendment invocation, uh, are covered 
and the statement against interest, council relies on all the statements that he doesn't intend to introduce. Um, and for purposes of uh, the sort of catch-all exception, well, incidentally, before I get there, the statement against interest in criminal cases also requires some uh, indication of trustworthiness uh, before they can be admitted in a criminal case. Well, isn't that taken care of by a court finding that it is so far contrary to the person's penal interest? That's that's the reliability part. Otherwise, we wouldn't have needed the, the second part of the rule, which says that if it's an inculpatory statement but exculpates another, you have to have corroboration. That same corroboration requirement does not seem to apply to the first sentence. And I say that to just note that it's almost saying it has to be, it's corroborated or it is re considered reliable because it is so clearly and far contrary to a person's penal interest. The statement against interest has an additional requirement in criminal cases, and that is some indication of trustworthiness for the entire statement. So it's similar to the analysis under the sort of catch-all exception 807. And, you know, there's a lot about Mr. Hall's statement that is uh, self-serving and unreliable. For example? And, I'm sorry? For example? For example, um, he denies um, giving any pills to Mr. Floyd, uh, denies that he had pills. We know a lot of uh, that is not, uh, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that's not true. He gave false information at the scene at least twice. Uh, he did flee. Uh, from Minnesota and had to be apprehended in Texas. Uh, he uh, gave uh, very sketchy details about his own involvement. Uh, he denied having any fake money, passing any fake money. So and there are a lot of uh, reasons to doubt uh, Mr. Hall's credibility when uh, analyzing the entire giving of this statement. It's very self-serving, obviously. And well, what are your thoughts regarding the body of evidence that would be considered that he could legitimately take a Fifth Amendment claim of compelled self-incrimination versus, is it smaller, larger, or as counsel said, the same group of factors that fall under 804b3 uh, statement against penal interest? Well, that's, that's I think, my, the primary point I was trying to make. The evidence that counsel thinks can come in despite the invocation of the Fifth Amendment, none of that is a statement against interest. It's a description he had of others, you know, of Mr. Floyd. That's not implicating himself and thereby not creating a statement against interest or something that would implicate him beyond the obvious fact that he is present. You know, he's present in a vehicle where drugs are present. Um, there are uh, indications that he may not have been truthful when he said he didn't give Mr. Floyd any pills and may not have been uh, aware of that. Um, and, you know, in our proposed questions, uh, he will have to be asked if he was on, under the influence of any controlled substances that day because it fundamentally affects his ability to know, remember, and relate. Um, and that I think we will have then potentially an invocation you know, just on that question alone. But that sphere of evidence counsel wants to put in through Mr. Hall um, does not constitute a statement against interest. Other statements he made, through which I think even the court realizes he would have the right to invoke uh, the Fifth Amendment, are what he's, uh, what counsel is claiming uh, are these statements against interest. So the statements he wants in don't fit under that exception. They're just plain hearsay. And so that's the you know, the fundamental problem that we have with trying to limit this sphere of information to come out of Mr. Floyd, or to come out of Mr. Hall, excuse me, is that it's, they're not a statement against interest. All right. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this under advisement until after lunch. I'll look at the super case and consider counsel's arguments, and I'll give you a ruling at 1 o'clock uh, before we bring the jury back. Yes, sir. Yes, please. It's at 781 Northwest 2D, 390, uh, Minnesota, Court of Appeals, 2010. All right. I'll take a look at that and consider counsel's arguments, and we'll come back at 
Your Honor, and, and for purposes, just to, for clarification, is in terms of the questions that I provided to the court, you had, as I understood the court's instructions, we were limiting those questions to just in the car. Correct. The time frame in the car. That's the basis. Um, the statement that uh, that Agent Henning uh, took that I would intend to potentially play would be more of a description because of what they did that day. Right. Understood. Okay. Any other motions we have to deal with this morning? Otherwise, we should start up with the jury. Yes, Your Honor. Discussion we had in chambers relevant to last night's events. Ah, do you have a motion? Make it Let's up. do it. Uh, yes, Your Honor, at this time I am uh, requesting again sequestration of the jury in view of uh, the incidents of last night. Um, as the court, I'm sure, is aware, uh, an officer involved shooting took place in the city of Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. As a result of that, there was some fairly extensive civil unrest that occurred. Um, I would note for the court um, that we have at least one juror who is a resident of that particular city um, and other jurors who have connections to Brooklyn Center. Um, given, the, given that you know, this is obviously a high profile case, this is a case that uh, evokes a lot of emotion from, for a lot of people. Ultimately, Your Honor, the question becomes, will the jury be confident to, to make a decision regardless of the potential outcome of their decision? There's two possible verdicts here, right? Guilty or not guilty. And my concern is, is that these jurors, and it's been an ongoing concern that, that a juror in Hennepin County um, being exposed extensively to the media before uh, before coming in and serving as a juror, um, being at least initially cautioned only to avoid news about this particular incident, um, you know, we, we've questioned one juror already about whether she had seen some uh, particular pieces of information that had not been presented in court. She, I felt, had credible responses to the court. Uh, but ultimately, this, in, this incident, while it is... I understand it's not this case. I understand that it is not involved, that it does not involve these same parties. But the problem is, is that the emotional response that that case creates sets the stage for a jury to say, I'm not going to vote not guilty because I'm concerned about the outcome. During voir dire, we had many, many jurors who um, dis on both sides of the political or social debate who expressed concern about the out, if they don't agree, if, if the public doesn't agree with the verdict. This incident last night highlights and I think brings it to the forefront of the jury's uh, mindset that a verdict uh, in this case is going to have consequences. Um, or, and they've been exposed to, to that uh, already. So at this point, I would request that the court further voir dire First and foremost, further voir dire jurors as to whether or not they have learned of this, because some jurors may be completely avoiding the media and some may not. Um, so we should, I believe, first voir dire jurors to see what, if anything, they have learned about last night's events. Second, whether those events would have any impact on um, their uh, decision-making process or concerns about their decision-making process. I think that the jury should be sequestered. I think that the jury should have been sequestered. I've made that clear in previous uh, discussions and motions. I think the jury should have been sequestered throughout the pendency of this trial. And I think that the jury needs to be cautioned at the beginning of every day and at the end of every day to avoid all media. Again, I've, we've had discussions about that in chambers. Um, so I believe, Your Honor, that, um, that at a bare minimum, that's what should happen. Does the state have a position? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. The state opposes the motion for sequestration. I don't believe that sequestration would be a, a remedy that would be appropriate or, frankly, effective in this matter. Um, as counsel pointed out, this is a, it's a different case. Uh, it's a different department. It is an officer-involved shooting. It is something that happened uh, nearby. 
we really don't know uh, what the facts of the case are at this particular point as those things are unfolding. But uh, world events happen. Things continue to happen in the state um, despite the fact that we're all here in trial. Um, that's just what happens. And we can't have every single world event that might uh, affect somebody's uh, attitude or emotional state or anything be the grounds to come back and re voir dire all the jurors. Um, the court, uh, you know, in our voir dire process, we asked the jurors, uh, you know, specifically the issue that uh, Mr. Nelson is concerned about, whether they would be so concerned about the outcome of a verdict that they wouldn't be unable to be fair and impartial and render either a guilty or not guilty verdict. And all of the jurors who were sworn and impaneled um, said that they would be able to do that. And the court will further instruct them that they are to do that. They're, they're to render their verdict without regard uh, to the result. And the law presumes that jurors follow the court's instructions. And we should presume that they meant what they said when they said it, that they could set aside these external issues and decide the case based solely on the evidence. So I think it would be inappropriate to voir dire uh, jurors now about events that, while uh, related and being on the same topic of the case, do not involve this case. In terms of uh, sequestration, I don't think that would be an effective remedy. Again, uh, it, as far as the court admonishing the jurors to uh, avoid all media, um, I don't oppose that request. I think that it does uh, present some issues. If you order the jurors to avoid all media, man, it's very difficult to avoid all media. And, and we'd have to tightly define what does avoid all media mean. Uh, you know, years ago it used to mean don't read the newspaper, don't watch TV. It means something different now, I suppose. Uh, media comes at us in all different forms. I think it'd be very difficult to follow an order to avoid all media. And uh, while it might have the effect of reducing the media contact, I wouldn't want to have a situation where then if a juror uh, inadvertently received some media on some unrelated thing, that that would be a grounds of you know claiming juror misconduct because they didn't follow what would be you know a nearly impossible court order. So I think the court could fashion some guidance uh, as to what to do. They could you could encourage them to avoid all media. Um, you could even order them to do it. But if something inadvertently uh, filters through. I think we can't overreact to it. I think we'd have to, to you know, look at that as a, on an individual basis, just like you did with the other uh, juror question that we had the other day, and we found out that it really wasn't what it what we thought it could have been. I'm going to deny the motion to sequester the jury and for additional blood here. Uh, this is a totally different case. It's if, and I realize there's civil unrest, and maybe some of the jurors did hear about that. The reason why, in my initial order, I said we we're not going to sequester, but we might go to it in the middle of trial if, and the concern there was that despite keeping jurors anonymous, that somebody may find out who one of the jurors is and reach out and have an inappropriate attempt to tamper with the jury. We have no indication that that's happened in this case, and that was the concern about going to sequestration. I understand the argument from the defense that this now puts them even more uh, ill at ease, but I think sequestering them would only aggravate that. Oh, I heard about the civil unrest and now the judge is putting us into sequestration. There must be a greater threat to our security. I think the better way is to just continue with the trial as we've been going, that that's a separate issue, they should treat it as such. It'd be a different story if it was civil unrest following another verdict where the jury can see what the consequence of a certain verdict might be in a similar case, but that's not this case. Uh, the jurors all are aware and were concerned about their safety because of what happened uh, in May of 2020, the civil unrest that followed there. Not a big surprise that there is now civil unrest in response to this case, but I don't think that should heighten the jurors' concern. I think it's probably the same as it was before. They all have a concern that they expressed and were very honest about. And so I'm not going to sequester them. We'll sequester them on Monday when we anticipate uh, doing closings. So I will uh, proceed accordingly. So with that, uh, let's bring in the jury.
morning, members of the jury. Sorry it took a little longer for the legal issues we had this morning, but we'll get started with our first witness for the day. Good morning, Your Honor, uh, Council, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the state will call Dr. Jonathan Rich. You swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I affirm. Thank you. And doctor, if you wouldn't mind, we'd appreciate it if you could take your mask off. Thank you. And I think the microphone should be in about the right place, but let's test it out by having us or having you give us your full name, spelling each of your names. My name is Jonathan Rich, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, R-I-C-H. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, AirPods? Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Rich, you're a medical doctor. You have to answer yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Would you tell us where you're currently employed? Sure. Um, I am a cardiologist at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago, Illinois where I also am an associate professor of medicine at Northwestern University. Dr. Rich, what have you come to talk to the jury about today? I'm here as an expert cardiology um, specialist to provide my opinion as to how Mr. George Floyd died. Have you ever testified in a court of law before? This is my first time. Would you bl briefly summarize for us your educational background? Sure. So I attended the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign uh, for my undergraduate studies where I majored in biology and uh, performed uh, my pre-medical coursework. Where did you go to medical school? I went to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. And uh, do you know what a residency is? Yes, I do know what a residency is. Uh, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what a residency is? Sure. So after uh, completing medical school, um, I went on to do uh, training in internal medicine, and that training is referred to as a residency. Um, I believe the term originated because you seem to spend all your time in the hospital. You were basically a resident there. Um, and so that was a three-year internal medicine residency. And where did you do that residency? I did that at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, at Harvard Medical School. Did you also have something called a fellowship? Yes, I did. What is a fellowship? So upon completing internal medicine residency training, um, many will go on to practice at that point. Um, I opted to specialize um, in cardiology. And so when you take on an additional specialty, that form of training is referred to as a fellowship. And so did you do a fellowship? Yes. And where did you do your fellowship? So I did my fellowship at the University of Chicago. And were you what's known as a chief fellow? Yes, I was the chief fellow. What is a chief fellow? So every fellowship program has about, on average, um, 18 uh, cardiology fellows, six in each class. And so I was uh, bestowed the honor to be the chief fellow, which is basically being the, the captain of the group. 
Did you have any additional training then after your fellowship? Yes, I did. What was that? So after completing cardiology fellowship, I decided that I wanted to um, sub-specialize further um, in um, a field of advanced heart disease that focuses on heart failure and heart transplantation. Are you board certified? Yes, I am board certified in both cardiovascular diseases and in advanced heart failure and transplant medicine. Transplant cardiology? That's correct. What, what is transplant cardiology as a field? So, thankfully, most people are not going to need a heart transplant, but on occasion, uh, patients' hearts will worsen over time and get to the point where they're tremendously weak um, and can't function on their own anymore. The medicine isn't working. And so the field of transplant cardiology is one in which we try to see if we can um, find a suitable match for that individual um, to get them a heart transplant, uh, essentially to restore their life. Are you trained in basic and advanced cardiac, cardiac life support? Yes, I am. Um, and I renew that training uh, every two years as part of my job. Let's uh, talk a bit about your employment background. Uh, after you finished your uh, fellowship, where did you go to work? Right. So after completing the heart failure and transplant fellowship, I took my first position at the University of Chicago uh, as a cardiovascular specialist in heart failure. And were you employed there until May of 2013? That is correct. And where did you go to work after that? So since May of 2013, I have been at Northwestern University, as I mentioned earlier, as one of the um, heart failure and transplant cardiologists. Do you hold uh, any leadership positions at Northwestern? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, what's that? So um, one of them is I am the medical director of the Mechanical Circulatory Support Program. Okay. Mechanical Circulatory Support Program. Right. Now, what is that? Yeah, I'll keep it brief. But basically, we talked about heart transplant for a minute. So patients whose hearts become very weak and perhaps they're not a good suitable match for a transplant or uh, they just don't have time to wait for a transplant, uh, we can implant mechanical heart pumps that combine with their weakened heart can restore blood flow to their body to improve their quality of life and allow them to live longer. Do you have any other uh, relevant leadership uh, positions at Northwestern? Uh, yes, I do. I'm also the program director of the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant Fellowship Training Program. And what does your job then at Northwestern entail as relates to um, either heart disease treatment prevention? Sure. So I could answer that uh, by basically putting it into three major domains. As a cardiologist, I uh, perform a lot of clinical work. That is probably the most intensive part of my uh, job. Before you go on, would you tell the jury what's meant by clinical work as compared to what? Absolutely. Clinical work basically means patient care. Okay, so it's the actual acts of taking care of patients, whether it be in the hospital, outside the hospital. That's what we kind of think of when we say clinical. Um, I also do um, a fair amount of education and teaching. I teach the students, residents, and fellows. Um, I travel across the country and de deliver lectures on a variety of cardiovascular topics and help chair um, medical meetings. And then the third part of my um, job as a cardiologist is I conduct uh, clinical research um, and have been doing so in a variety of cardiovascular diseases for uh, nearly 20 years. Do you spend most of your time, though, providing clinical care to patients? Yes, that is for sure the most intense uh, aspect of my job. And what does your clinical practice then entail in terms of taking care of patients? Sure. So um, my clinical practice has three components. Number one is my job in the hospital. So I spend several months, sometimes four to five months of the year, as the lead cardiologist rounding in the hospital, taking care of basically the sickest heart disease patients in the hospital, and I also oversee their care in the intensive care unit. The second part of my clinical duties is I see patients in the outpatient setting, in, in the office, in the clinic, uh, where I evaluate, diagnose, and treat patients. Um, close to 50% of the patients, the new ones that I see in the clinic, um, are referred by other cardiologists because these patients can sometimes have pretty complex medical conditions. 
And then um, the third part of my clinical work um, is I perform procedures uh, in a procedural suite we call the cath lab, uh, where I measure pressures inside the heart and inside the lungs. And sometimes I will also take small biopsy samples of the inner lining of the heart uh, for diagnostic purposes. Given that you uh, deal with a number of patients who could be really sick, uh, do you ever have patients that will pass away? So mm -hmm. I work with a tremendous team um, at Northwestern, and my colleagues save countless lives, but unfortunately, uh, many patients do die. Do you ever have any involvement in determining the cause of death? Oh, yes, I do. Could you explain? Sure. Um, one of the most important parts of my job, in fact, is to determine what's wrong with the patient, including if they do actually die, how did they die? And so there are a number of ways in which I participate in that role of figuring out what happened to a patient, how did they die? Do you, are you involved in any hospital uh, committees uh, that have as their purposes determining the cause of why people die or pass away? Sure, um, I do. So outside of being in the trenches, taking care of the patients at the bedside and figuring out what's going on and trying to discern what might have happened, um, I also participate on a committee uh, that meets regularly. And what we do is we review all of the cases in the cardiac intensive care unit we look at any near deaths and any deaths, and we review looking at the medical chart and all the evidence to try to figure out what might have happened um, for quality purposes, to figure out if there was something else we could have done, um, and also to improve just our overall knowledge of the field. Do you have experience with patients who sometimes uh, pass away during what's called clinical trials? Yes, so I also participate in clinical trials where we try to determine if a certain medication or a certain device is is um, worthy of being approved to help patients. Um, in the course of clinical trials, sometimes there are deaths. And so in my role, I have sat on committees. And our purpose on that committee is to review any deaths that do occur, look at all the evidence to figure out, number one, um, why did the death happen? And number two, and sometimes this is one of the more important parts, to distinguish was it a cardiac cause or was it for some for a reason that is not related to the heart. Well, bringing this further home to this case, uh, do you have experience with cardiac patients who die from what we call low oxygen? Oh, most certainly I do. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, because I am a cardiologist who takes care of patients in the intensive care unit, um, having low oxygen levels is not uncommon. A lot of different disease processes uh, can cause it and low oxygen levels um, can be very um, detrimental. Um, some of our patients require ventilators um, and respirators. Uh, and so in the course of caring for these patients, sometimes they succumb, they succumb to their illness because their body is not able to get enough oxygen. Do you ever have to determine cause of death in the heart transplant context? Yes. So. Um, in the field of heart transplantation, what happens is when you get a phone call that um, somebody has died and they uh, want to be an organ donor. So um, what I need to do is look at the case from afar, but try to look at all the records as closely as possible to really sort out um, how that individual died and if there's any issues related to their heart or other parts of their body to make absolutely sure that that heart would be a good match for my patient who we're trying to, um, to help. And so um, that's another element where you have to be really meticulous as you go through. You don't want to miss anything here, right? I mean, the stakes are way too high. We've heard from a couple of pathologists uh, in the trial. Uh, does your job uh, require you to work with pathologists? Oh, yes, it does. In what way? So I work with cardiac pathologists actually pretty closely, um, perhaps more so than um, um, other general cardiologists. Um, I mentioned that I take biopsy specimens of the inner lining of the heart, and I send those specimens to the pathologist to review under the microscope. Um, we participate in conferences that include reviewing autopsies. Um, one of the 
um, things that I have learned over the years, and I've been actually taught this by the cardiac pathologists, is that while a pathologist can look under the microscope and give us very important information, um, I work with a world-renowned cardiac pathologist who reminds me nearly every day, please tell me as much clinical information as you can. Put it in clinical context because how I diagnose and interpret I see under the microscope is very much uh, influenced by the clinical story. And so we work very closely together because my pathologist looks under the microscope and actually sees the tissue at that level and I can provide all of the clinical information, the timelines, et cetera, so we can truly get it right. Just a little bit more background, Dr. Rich. Uh, have you published in the field of cardiology? Yes, I have. Can you generally characterize what kinds of publications and how many? Sure. So um, to date, um, I've published uh, more than 200 combined um, abstracts, original manuscripts, reviews, and book chapters. Um, and the topics have uh, been pretty wide ranging in the field of cardiology uh, from coronary artery disease, uh, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, uh, congestive heart failure, and another disease actually called pulmonary hypertension. And, and what is pulmonary hypertension? Uh, pulmonary hypertension is high pressures that are specific to the blood vessels in the lungs. All right, so when the blood flows from the heart to the lungs, if the pressure is high in those blood vessels, we refer to that as pulmonary hypertension. Doctor, would you generally uh, describe for the jurors what is cardiology as a science? Sure. So cardiology is the study of the heart at the most basic level. It's the study of how the heart functions, um, what happens when the heart develops disease, um, pretty much everything heart-related and how it interacts with the rest of the body in order to sustain life. How do you go about assessing a patient with a cardiology issue? Sure. So um, when you assess any patient, with or without a cardiology issue, but in, a, in, the, in this context, a cardiology issue. Um, you typically begin by meeting the individual in the office, taking a history, doing a detailed physical examination, reviewing all of the medical records and the charts, looking at past procedures uh, and tests that they may have had, um, sometimes speaking to other colleagues uh, who you are caring for that patient with together, um, and then sometimes ordering your own tests for evaluation and diagnostic purposes. Are some of your patients referred then from other cardiologists? Yes, so um, because um, of my specialty in advanced heart disease, um, uh, close to half the patients who are um, I'm seeing in the office as new patients have been referred to me by other cardiologists, um, typically in the community or in the region, um, and I will um, assist them in, in consultation to figure out what's going on and what we need to do uh, to help that individual. Uh, in the ICU, do you take care of patients who have problems beyond the heart? Yes, so, you know, it's interesting. Um, as a cardiologist, I think part of the important reasons why they require of us to do that internal medicine residency training is because no organs work in isolation. And so my patients who have heart disease who also require the intensive care unit they will usually have issues with many other organs, their lungs, their kidneys, sometimes their brain, um, their liver. And so you really have to be adept and um, have a really good understanding of not just the heart, but all of the organs of the body and really how they interact. Dr. Rich, let's talk about your role uh, in this litigation. Um, how did you come to be involved in this case? Um, I was contacted by the state of Minnesota and I was asked as a cardiologist if I could uh, review the facts of this case uh, to help determine how Mr. George Floyd died. Have you been uh, compensated by the state for the bulk of the work you've done on this case? No, up, un up until my time here now at trial, um, I have not received compensation. And why not? Um, well. Um, probably for a couple of reasons. Mostly, I felt that my uh, job as a cardiologist could really help inform the facts of this case. Every year, I take on a number of professional activities uh, without compensation. I actually think it's a duty of our field. And so in this case, I felt I can make a meaningful contribution 
to the medical field. So for your, uh, the compensation for your time while you're here at trial, uh, are you being compensated at $1,200 per day? Yeah, it's $1,200 a day while I'm missing work back at home. Right. So let's talk about then uh, your opinion or opinions in this case. Uh, before we do, could you tell us what work you did? What did you review before forming opinions in the case? Sure. Um, so I was provided with a lot of evidence to, to look through, um, but mostly I looked through the medical records, um, uh, interviews, um, all the videos that were provided to me, um, and the autopsy report. Did you review some journal articles as well? Yeah, as I was um, formulating my opinion and creating um, my expert report, um, I also um, looked up journal articles and embedded them into my report for references. Uh, have you formed uh, any opinions in this case to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to the cause of Mr. Floyd's death? Yes, I have. Would you tell us your opinion or opinions? Sure. Um, in this case, Mr. George, George Floyd died from a cardiopulmonary arrest it was caused by low oxygen levels, and those low oxygen levels were induced by the prone restraint and positional asphyxiation that he was subjected to. Well, let's discuss your um, opinion, Dr. Rich, and let's start it with just a general discussion of the circulatory system in the heart. So I'd like to talk about the right side of the heart, left side of the heart, and, uh, and also the uh, alveoli. Uh, would you start off and uh, just tell the jury, just remind them, what are the alveoli? Sure. So you might remember hearing about this, but the alveoli are those grape-like structures um, that are at the very bottoms of the lungs. The alveoli is where the actual gas exchange occurs, meaning that is where when we take a breath in, oxygen gets across the lungs and into the bloodstream. And then the carbon dioxide that needs to leave the body crosses that same barrier into those alveoli. So when we take our deep breath out, that's how the carbon dioxide is removed. So it's the alveoli of the lungs uh, that serve that purpose. And, and again, what does the heart do in the body? What does the heart do? Well, the heart is um, the major pump, of course, of the body. Um, the best way to think of the heart, in my view, is to actually think of it as two pumps, sort of a right side and a left side. So if we start with the right side of the heart, after all that blood got pumped to the body and is coming back to the heart, blood is always returned to the right side of the heart. So this is now blood that presumably does not have much oxygen in it, and it needs to get more oxygen. So that right side of the heart, its job is singular. It is to pump blood to the lungs, to those alveoli. So the blood, when it heads towards the lungs, it can pick up that oxygen that it doesn't have right now, and it can deliver carbon dioxide and other acids and waste products to be expelled from the body. Once that blood from the right side of the heart has picked up the oxygen that it needed, it sends it to the left side of the heart. Now the left side of the heart uh, gets all the glory um, because it is what then pumps all of that oxygen and nutrient-rich blood to the entire body, meaning to the to the lungs, to the kidneys, to the brain, to our muscles, uh, to deliver oxygen because every organ, every tissue of the body needs oxygen in order to function. And then once that process occurs, it repeats back to the right side and so forth. And, and what happens if the lungs can't deliver sufficient oxygen to the heart? That is, if there's a low <laughs> oxygen situation. Okay, well, um, the heart is only as good as the fuel that it's provided with. So when that uh, right side of the heart sends blood to the lungs and says, okay, um, can I have some oxygen, please? If there is no oxygen there or not enough oxygen there, there is nothing the heart can do to extract more from the lungs. So it has to take that deoxygenated blood, that blood that does not have enough oxygen, and pump it to the left side of the body. The left side of the body says, okay, this is what I have. This is what I'm gonna pump now. And so what ends up happening is if the lungs don't give enough oxygen to the body, the heart then has to pump insufficiently oxygenated blood to the tissues of the body, and that's when problems occur. Well, then returning to your opinion, cardiopulmonary arrest caused by low oxygen, 
induced by positional asphyxia. Uh, what caused uh, the low level of oxygen uh, in the case of Mr. George Floyd? Well, in his case, um, it was the truly the prone restraint and positional uh, restraints that led to his asphyxiation. In a nutshell, um, he was just simply unable, using all of his muscles of respiration, his chest wall, uh, what we call accessory muscles of respiration, which are extra muscles that will um, be triggered in the event that you're having trouble breathing. Um, he was trying to get in enough oxygen, and because he was unable to, because of the position that he was subjected to, um, as we just discussed, the heart thus didn't have enough oxygen either, which then means the entire body is deprived of oxygen. So, low oxygen induced by positional asphyxia. Did you consider other possible causes for Mr. Floyd's death? Sure. I tried, to, of course, to be as thorough as possible, but I focused mostly on two other potential causes. Number one is whether there could have been a primary heart contribution to George Floyd's death, and the second was whether a drug overdose could have caused his death. So, Doctor, would you tell the jury what, what is a primary heart event? Sure. So, <clears throat> a lot of things can injure the heart. For example, if you do not take in enough oxygen, that will injure all the organs, including the heart. When I use the term a primary heart event, I mean something that originated from the heart itself. So for example, a heart attack. All right, one of the arteries of the heart just suddenly got blocked completely and a heart attack occurred. Or um, the heart just without any um, explanation, nothing else secondary inducing it, went into a serious uh, ventricular arrhythmia, okay? So the bottom part of the heart, that part that we were talking about that needs to pump blood to the body, suddenly went into a chaotic rhythm all on its own. Um, if any of those things happened, then I would consider that a primary heart issue, not being caused or secondary to something else. So you considered whether or not Mr. Floyd might have passed away from a primary heart event or a drug overdose. Uh, did you uh, reach an opinion or conclusion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether either of those two causes explain Mr. Floyd's death? Yes, I did. Uh, would you tell us your opinion? Sure. Um, after re reviewing all of the facts and evidence of the case, uh, I can state with a high degree of medical certainty that George Floyd did not die from a primary cardiac event and he did not die from a drug overdose. Thank you, Dr. Rich. Would you tell us uh, what, what evidence or facts, documents, what did you look at uh, to help you to reach that conclusion about the uh, primary heart uh, event and or drug overdose? Sure. Um, the three aspects of the evidence that I spent the most time reviewing were Mr. George Floyd's medical records, um, the videos, the different angles from the day that he died on May 25th, 2020, and the autopsy report. So the medical records, uh, the videos, and then the autopsy report. Yes. Uh, let's start with the uh, medical records then of those three. Uh, would you tell the jury what you were looking for in the medical records? Sure. So you get the medical records, uh, it's usually pretty thick, but you take it one page at a time. And at the outset, I was looking to see if he had been diagnosed with any medical conditions. That's sort of the first step. Um, you know, kind of, it's what you do with a patient in the office, sort of, what medical problems do you have? And so I was looking to see initially what diagnoses George Floyd may have previously been diagnosed with. And what were your takeaways then from having looked at the medical records and done this ass assessment? So at that level, um, I felt pretty confident that he, uh, Mr. Floyd had three uh, medical problems. Um, number one, um, he had hy hypertension, high blood pressure. Uh, number two, it appeared to me that he may, had su may have suffered from anxiety. And three, um, it looked like he also struggled uh, with substance abuse. Other than uh, those three conditions, uh, did Mr. Floyd have any diagnosis of heart disease while he was still alive? No, he did not. 
So you said you looked at the, the medical uh, records not only for uh, diagnoses of pre-existing conditions, uh, but also for evidence of medical encounters? Correct. Uh, and, did, and by that you mean hospital visits, clinics, et cetera? Emergency room visits, exactly. exactly. What, what did you find in that regard? So this is, in my opinion, was a really important part of the review as well um, because every time Mr. Floyd had an encounter with a medical professional, I viewed that as an opportunity to see if there was any signs, symptoms whatsoever, even subtle, uh, that could have indicated, for example, that he had anything going on with his heart. And so at the emergency room visits, um, he had one uh, prolonged hospitalization. I really tried to take a look at everything. I looked at any opportunity I could to see if he ever complained of chest pain, which he did not, palpitations, which is a fluttering sensation of the heart. I reviewed all of the documented physical examinations um, of his heart to see if there were any abnormalities noted and there were not, no murmurs, uh, nothing, nothing found. I looked at all of his labs uh, that get sent to see if there were any cardiac markers of injury, which he did not have. Mm -hmm. I reviewed his EKGs and his, and his other tests. Um, I tried to be as thorough as possible because I view this as, I view what we do as a clinician in some ways as actually being a bit of a detective. Um, and our job is to try to figure out what might be going on, even if it's not overtly stated so in the chart. Would you, would you tell the jury, by the way, what an EKG is? Sure, of course. So an EKG is a shorthand for an electrocardiogram. Um, that's the test where uh, you'll see people put these little sticky things on the chest. We call them electrodes. And what an EKG basically is, is an opportunity at the surface level of the chest, but the technology is so fascinating, it can give you a glimpse into the heart itself to see a whole host of things, including is there any evidence of any heart injury happening now or previously? Any abnormal heart rhythms? Um, uh, a whole host of uh, other information that we can get from the EKG at that snapshot in time. Um, and then sometimes what we'll do is we'll repeat EKGs down the line so we can compare and contrast and see if anything had changed. So you looked at all of this medical information on Mr. Floyd, including the EKG. Uh, did you note any cardiac problems that related to Mr. Floyd? I noted no cardiac problems in the medical records um, as far as Mr. Floyd's uh, medical condition was concerned, including um, everything I mentioned, the EKG, even a, a time where they put him on a continuous cardiac telemetry monitor, um, which they'll do sometimes just to see beat to beat if anything's going on, I reviewed that as well. Did you see any evidence of Mr. Floyd having had any abnormal heart rhythms? Um, his EKG showed absolutely no abnormal heart rhythms. He, that cardiac telemetry that I mentioned um, that he had on for um, a few days um, did have um, on a rare occasion something you would call a PVC, uh, which is a very normal finding. I don't know if anyone's ever felt their uh, carotid flutter for a second or something like that. It happens to all of us. Uh, but absolutely no ventricular arrhythmias for the duration of the time that he was on the monitor. And, and PVC is not a kind of plastic pipe. You mean pre, <laughs> preventricular Sorry. contraction. Yeah, premature, premature ventricular contraction. Sometimes people refer to it as a skipped beat. Um, a really normal phenomenon if you drink a little coffee or anything else, you're sleep deprived. Um, it's pretty common for us to have those totally normal finding, something that none of you should be concerned about uh, if, if you feel that from time to time. So did you find any evidence that Mr. Floyd had any negative heart conditions? There was absolutely no evidence uh, of, to suggest that at all. Uh, Dr. Rich, isn't high blood pressure an abnormal heart condition? So thank you for that question um, because I think that's an area of confusion sometimes. So high blood pressure in and of itself is not a heart condition. High blood pressure occurs for basically two reasons. Number one, um, high blood pressure originates in the blood vessels of our bodies. Oftentimes it's genetically determined why our blood pressure might start to go up over time. If you have a strong heart, you can also generate high blood pressures, and so those two in combination. So why well, so I'll, I'll pause there and, and can explain more.
Well, did Mr. Floyd have a strong heart? So every indicator is that Mr. Floyd had actually an exceptionally strong heart because he was able to generate pressures uh, of upwards of 200 millimeters of mercury on some occasions. Um, we talked a little earlier about my role as a heart transplant cardiologist. One of the problems with patients when they need a heart transplant is the exact opposite. Their hearts are so weak they can't generate a high blood pressure. Their top number might just be 80. The reason why high blood pressure though is important, and it is important to treat high blood pressure, is because over time, if high blood pressure goes untreated, 10, 20, 30 years, the impact of that high pressure on the heart can eventually start to become a bit of a problem. So the way I explain it to my patients who come into the office and I talk to them about treating their high blood pressure is I say, remember, the heart is a muscle. So if you go to the gym and you pick up a couple of dumbbells and you start to lift the weights, initially it feels fine. In fact, you probably get a little stronger. Your heart, uh, excuse me, your muscle will likely get even a little thicker, a little bigger, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. And initially, that might actually be a really good thing. But if I came back, you know, 10 years later and said, how's it going? You'd say, man, this is getting pretty tough. Um, and then the muscle can start to tire out. So we do want to treat high blood pressure. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. High blood pressure should be treated, uh, but high blood pressure in and of itself um, is not a uh, heart condition. So we, we've talked about your view of the medical records. Uh, you told us that you also looked at video footage in forming your opinions. Uh, would you tell us what you were looking for in the video footage that you examined? Sure. So my approach to the video um, initially was sort of similar to my approach of the medical records, uh, meaning I wanted to just do some cursory inspection, observation, basic stuff. Um, what did Mr. Floyd look like? Um, was Mr. Floyd talking? And if he was talking, was he talking clearly, uh, coherently, uh, answering questions appropriately? Um, did I notice any um, uh, evidence of abnormal physical exams on the video, actually, I was trying to look for as well. Um, when Mr. Floyd was walking, did he appear like he was walking without um, difficulty or was it looking like he was perhaps with low blood pressure and maybe gonna, gonna fall down? Um, I was listening for any opportunity I could to hear he might say I'm having chest pain or I'm having those palpitations or fluttering sensations. Um, basically doing what I, I do when I assess any person for a possible medical problem. I was looking for any uh, and all of those possible subtle signs. And so this is video, video footage from Mr. Floyd's encounter on May 25th of last year. May 25th, that's correct. Um, were you were focused on uh, things that would give you any, any insights into his ability to breathe? Yes, of course. Um, and uh, the ability to expand uh, what's referred to as his chest wall. Yes. Um, again, to refresh the recollection of the jury, what is the chest wall? Yeah, so the chest wall, which I'm trying to sort of show you with my hands here, um, basically makes up the bones uh, and the muscles of the entire rib cage. Um, and it might have been explained um, previously uh, to you, um, but the, um, the chest wall and the muscles and how they interact along with the diaphragm muscle inside are the um, key structures that determine if someone is able to take in enough air and able to get enough out. Uh, so if there is, the, for example, the lungs can be working okay, but if the chest wall is diseased, if the muscles associated with the chest wall aren't able to contract and move and do their job, enough oxygen can't get in that way either. So, so doctor, in our uh, COVID world, um, do you make clinical assessments of your patients in your work life uh, by video? Yes, actually that is, um, that is one of the transformations that we have uh, needed to adapt to this past year. Um, we are getting back to now seeing most of our patients in person, uh, but during the course of this pandemic, uh, to minimize exposures, we've set, a lot of the, we've set up a lot of these televideo visits with patients. And what I came to appreciate is that while there's no substitute 
to actually putting your hands on a patient. Uh, that's still preferable, in my opinion, to really examine them closely. Um, you can get a lot of information off of a video assessment, even physical examination, by looking at, I have them turn their neck to the side and I can see their neck veins, which is an indicator of pressures. I can see their legs to look if there's any indication of swelling, which might be congestive heart failure. Of course, I could just see the patient. I can see how they're breathing. I can hear how they're talking, if they seem breathless or short of breath. So we actually have uh, found out that we can do a lot via video um, assessments. Uh, were you able to then see Mr. Floyd uh, at the period of time after he was first approached by the police on May 25th, 2020? Yes. Um, what were your observations about Mr. Floyd from that initial encounter with the police? Um, so from his initial encounter, um, um, remembering particularly when he was asked to get out of his car, um, he uh, appeared fearful, um, but was speaking, uh, I thought clearly, um, answering questions um, appropriately. Um, didn't see any acute, what we would call acute distress. Um, I saw no indicators at that time that he was uh, suffering from low oxygen, for example, or from any active medical problem. Um, and as I said, I was really trying to keep a close eye on some of the subtleties of his uh, appearance and, uh, and speech uh, and so forth. Were you able to observe at the point that he was being asked to get into the squad car? Yes, I was. Um, what were your observations with respect to that period of time? Yeah, so I watched him walk to the squad car, um, and then I um, was observing the, uh, intera an interaction where they were asking him to get into the um, back seat of the car. Um, I heard him talking about how he was uh, claustrophobic. Um, um, there were times when he was being, I'm not sure if it was pushed into the car or how it was, um, um, and it had even made indicators at that time that he, he couldn't breathe. Um, but all of my observations at that point were still that up until the point that he was kind of getting pushed or pulled through the car and ultimately onto the pavement, um, up until that point, I also saw no evidence that there was anything active going on um, from a cardiac standpoint. Um, and that was really important for me to, to conclude. And, and what sort of active thing uh, might you have been looking for related to the heart over that period of time? Yeah, so for example, let's say that he was having um, an arrhythmia, an abnormal heart rhythm, um, especially if it was originating from the heart. Oftentimes what will happen is you'll have the heart rhythm that goes abnormal and you'll go from being like totally fine, like hopefully we all are here today, to instantly dizzy or even passing out. I didn't see any indicators that that was happening. I didn't hear him complaining of dizziness or Again, you know, fluttering of the, of the chest. Um, I couldn't see any swelling in his body. Again, I didn't want to take anything from Grant for granted that even from the initial encounter up until that point, what if something developed from point A to point B? And so again, up until that point, I saw no indicators of low blood pressure uh, um, or anything else abnormal with the heart. Then, then turning then to the restraint on the ground that you were referring to, uh, what were your observations then as a cardiologist from your having viewed uh, Mr. Floyd's restraint on the ground by Mr. Schoen? Sure. So my observations were that he was um, uh, restrained uh, in a life-threatening manner. Um, specifically, my observations was that he was um, on the ground in the prone position, uh, handcuffed, hands behind the back, um, a knee on the back of his neck, a knee on the back of his upper torso or shoulder, uh, hands pushing his handcuffed hands further up into his chest. I observed um, a knee compressing his, uh, I thought it was his buttocks or upper thighs, uh, and then at various points uh, his lower limbs, his lower extremities uh, being uh, pinned down to the ground. Uh, so that my initial um, observation was what is the position first and foremost that he is being subjected to. And did you see at some point in you watching the video that Mr. Floyd uh, went into cardiopulmonary arrest? Eventually, yes, I did. Uh, do you know what Mr. Floyd's heart rhythm was uh, when he was taken from the scene? Well, so in the course of the restraint, um, I was looking to see if 
his deterioration occurred rapidly, like I was just talking about. For example, a primary cardiac event, the most common arrhythmia is what we call ventricular fibrillation, or VF for short, VFib. When that happens, the individual will look relatively okay, meaning they're alert, they're talking, and then they will immediately become unconscious. On the other hand, if the cause of the cardiopulmonary arrest was from something else, for example, low oxygen levels, you will typically see that deterioration happening much more gradually and slowly. So my observations were the second, that you could see, at least I could see, um, his um, speech starting to become less forceful, his muscle movements becoming weaker, um, until of course eventually his speech became absent, eventually his muscle movements were absent, and then as we later discovered by the heart rhythm, um, he was in a PEA, cardiopulmonary arrest. So I'd like to talk with you about uh, two uh, concepts, uh, the one being PEA. which is pulseless electrical activity and the other one being a, a thing called a systole. Mm -hmm. right. So first, uh, Dr. Rich, uh, would you tell us what pulseless electrical activity is? Sure. So pulseless electrical activity, uh, or for short PEA, is a chaotic heart rhythm um, that you can see on the EKG or on the cardiac monitor, um, but there is an absence of a pulse. And so it doesn't meet criteria for this asystole that I think we'll talk about in a minute, or for ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation, if I'll just use my fingers, is basically the heart rhythm looking like this. Okay, it's this little subtle fluttering, but basically nothing else going on. Um, pulseless electrical activity, if you are a clinician, a doctor, or a nurse, uh, or anyone for that matter, who's ever been trained in cardiac arrest, um, one of the things that will come to mind immediately is whenever you see a PEA arrest, you need to think about what's causing it because nearly all PEA arrests are being caused by something relatively specific. And if you can identify what that is, it can be reversed. And what is the most common cause of PEA? So you might have heard of others talking about the H's and the T's. So one of those H's the most common cause for a PEA, cardiopulmonary arrest, is hypoxia, uh, not enough oxygen levels. Low oxygen? Low oxygen. And what about asystole? So asystole is the flat line. So, you know, when any human dies, they will eventually go into asystole, where there will be absolutely no heart rhythm occurring, um, even this chaotic rhythm. Uh, that is what we, again, sometimes call the, that flat line. So VFib is this kind of thing. PEA can have a variety of chaotic looking uh, rhythms without a pulse, and asystole is the absolute absence of any cardiac electrical activity. If, uh, if Mr. Floyd is in a PEA state, or generally anyone, is uh, PEA reversible? So it, it is important to put it into context. So we see PEA cardiac arrests in the hospital all the time. Um, whenever you see a PEA cardiac arrest, uh, you rush to it, of course, and you begin the protocol. And that protocol is 
the H's and the T's. And so you give oxygen if you don't think they have enough oxygen. I mean, that's the most critical thing to do. Uh, depending on the other H's, for example, hypovolemia or hemorrhage. If you think they're bleeding out from a trauma, you would rush and give them blood. And we're doing these things, of course, simultaneously because time is of the essence. So we resuscitate patients with cardiopulmonary arrest from PEA, not infrequently. Unfortunately, PEA can also be a devastating cardiac arrest, and despite all of our best abilities, sometimes it's not reversible. Dr. Rich, did you see any uh, evidence at all that George Floyd had had a heart attack? No, none whatsoever. Uh, what about this, uh, this notion of something called a silent heart attack? A silent heart attack. Well, <laughs> so a silent heart attack. You know, um, a silent heart attack is sometimes referred if it looks like someone might have a, had a heart attack, but there were no clinical signs to suggest it. It's a relatively uncommon finding. It tends to happen in patients who have diabetes because when you have diabetes, one of the problems with diabetes is um, you lose some sensation in the nerve endings. And so typically when you're having a heart attack, you'll see people clutch their chest. Oh my God, I'm having chest pressure, chest pain. Sometimes diabetics won't have that and it's possible that they can have a silent heart attack. But there was no evidence that Mr. Floyd had any type of heart attack, a silent heart attack or a non-silent heart attack. And so you talked about this a little bit, uh, about uh, the uh, notion of a cardiac arrhythmia, mm -hmm. uh, the fluttering of the heart. Uh, I think you referred to as either the VFs or the VTs, yeah. ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. Right. Uh, was there any evidence that he'd had either one of those? No, there, there was no evidence that he had uh, any of those. When uh, somebody uh, is suffering from uh, ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia, uh, did you describe that as what we might refer to as a sudden death event? Yes, so ventricular fibrillation can certainly cause sudden cardiac death. Um, that absolutely could be described as that. And again, in, enjoyed, in, in, uh, in viewing uh, Mr. Floyd and his encounter uh, on the videos from May 25th, did Mr. Floyd die a sudden death? Mr. Floyd died a gradual death. Um, it would not be considered the classic sudden death from the standpoint of how you're putting into that context, meaning when people have that ventricular fibrillation, that VF arrest, they literally go from being fine one moment to completely out the next. You know, I don't know what happened. I was sitting next to him and he keeled over and was on the ground. And then that could have been a VF arrest. Um, so sometimes there's semantics uh, in terms of this. But in the case of Mr. Floyd, yes, he did have a cardiopulmonary arrest. But no, he did not. There was no evidence of a sudden cardiac death um, from VFib or any other malignant heart arrhythmia. Okay, so we've talked about your view of the medical records, and we've talked about your review of the video. Uh, the third thing you said you reviewed was the autopsy report and findings. Yes. What were you looking for with respect to the autopsy report and findings? Sure. So we're talking about the autopsy report here um, towards the end. I actually looked at the autopsy report first, then I went back to the medical records that we've already talked about in the videos, and then I went back to the autopsy again. So what I was looking for in the autopsy was, well, first of all, everything. When we get an autopsy, oftentimes you'll get it because you're looking, could there be something that we, didn't, we weren't aware of that could have happened? Uh, but in addition to looking at all the findings, my major focus, of course, as a cardiologist, uh, was anything and everything uh, related to the heart. What did you find? Um, you know, it's interesting, I think what was most important was not only what I found, but what I did not find. So what I found was that um, his heart um, architecturally looked normal. Um, <clears throat> he um, had a description of coronary artery disease, which I found notable because as I mentioned before, um, he hadn't carried a diagnosis of coronary artery disease. 
Now I mentioned that I found it notable. I certainly didn't find it unusual uh, because unfortunately coronary artery disease is so common. I mean statistically, not to scare anybody, many of us in this room likely have coronary artery disease. Um, I looked at whether there was any evidence whatsoever that Mr. Floyd could have had a heart attack based on autopsy. So when I looked at those arteries around the heart, I not only looked to see how narrow they were and what the composition of that narrowing was, but also whether there were any platelets or clotting factors or anything else of that nature in the arteries, which is what would be there if there was a heart attack. And, and then did you see evidence of the platelets you would expect to see if Mr. Floyd had had a heart attack? No, there were no description of any of the platelets or clotting factors or anything that would block off an artery. None of the arteries were totally, the word we we'll often use is occluded, totally blocked off, which is what happens in a heart attack. You know, I want to ask you about some of your uh, specific findings in this regard, but, but first, uh, for the jury, would you just tell them whether you excluded coronary artery disease as a cause for Mr. Floyd's death? Yes. Um, I have excluded that with a high degree of medical certainty. Uh, now, you talked about looking for evidence of platelets from the autopsy report and that you would expect it to have seen those if he uh, had died from a heart attack and you didn't see them. Right. Uh, what else did you see? Well, so what I also saw was I looked at the heart muscle itself. So not only did the heart muscle itself not show any evidence of any injury at all, which you would see, like what if he, you mentioned the silent heart attack, what about a few years ago somehow he had a mini heart attack? You would see evidence of that on the, in the heart, you would see uh, scar tissue, etc. So not only did I not see any evidence of a heart attack, um, the pathologist did a very good job in my opinion actually of describing what's called the endocardium. <clears throat> the endocardium is the innermost lining of the heart. And that is the most susceptible part of the heart to cardiac injury. Even the, the smallest of heart attacks will always originate on that endocardium, the inner lining. And the endocardium was not only described as normal, it was described as smooth and glistening, a completely normal finding, no evidence at all of even small microscopic injury. Were you able, by uh, your look, looking at the autopsy report on the heart, to tell whether there's any evidence as to whether Mr. Floyd had ever had a heart attack, even going back into the past? Yeah, no, no evidence whatsoever of a previous heart attack. Uh, doctor, what is ischemia? So ischemia is a um, reduction in blood flow um, to any organ of the body. Um, that could be the heart, it could be the kidney, um, that can lead to um, um, in basically insufficient delivery of oxygen for a short period of time. Um, and if ischemia continues to occur uh, for long enough, um, that can sometimes cause some irritability in that organ. But it's important to distinguish ischemia from uh, infarct. Infarct is actually what we mean when we say a heart attack, uh, excuse me, a heart attack. When a marathon runner goes on a run, their muscles will get temporarily ischemic. When we lift muscles in the gym and you know, they talk about feeling the burn, that means you are feeling ischemia. You're feeling lactic acid buildup and it's, that's what ischemia is. Any evidence of ischemia? Not on the autopsy, no. Uh, let's talk about the, uh, the blood vessels, the, the arteries mm -hmm. and the uh, plaque. Uh, that was in the arteries. Uh, were you able then to eliminate the occlusions, the blockage in the arteries as a contributing cause to Mr. Floyd's death? Yes, I'd like to um, clarify. I saw no occlusions, meaning I saw no complete blockages. There were narrowings. There were narrowings in more than one blood vessel. Um, importantly, the main coronary artery it's called the left main coronary artery. Um, there was no description of any narrowings or disease in the left main coronary artery. Why is that significant? 
Well, because that is the very first pathway that blood travels down to then branch off into, the, into multiple other arteries. And so um, left main disease, as we sometimes call it in cardiology, um, is uh, among all of the vessels, uh, probably the highest risk blood vessel uh, if it were to get blocked off. So how would you uh, characterize the, the nature of the uh, then plaque uh, within the artery? Was it uh, soft? Was it fractured? How would you characterize it? I would characterize it the way that the medical examiner characterized it. Um, um, I'm not an expert at characterizing um, plaque at a microscopic detail, but what I, I did appreciate was um, the description of what seemed to be not only relatively conventional looking um, artery narrowings, plaque buildup that we all will eventually get in our arteries, but also in one of the arteries <clears throat> it was described that there was an element of calcium. And um, I only mention that because that also indicates that this coronary artery disease didn't just kind of develop right away. It was probably a slow, gradual buildup of the narrowings, and that actually is a very clinically relevant finding in the field of cardiology. Doctor, did you make any assessments around the size of Mr. Floyd's heart? Yes, I did. Would you tell the jury about that? Sure. So um, when looking at the size of his heart, not just the size, but I, oh, the thickness of the heart, um, it was described as being mildly thick or mildly enlarged. Now, depending on which criteria you, you use, um, one criteria would agree with that, that it was mildly uh, thick or enlarged. Others would suggest that it was in the normal range. I do believe that it was likely mildly thick and mildly enlarged. It, w it is an expected finding uh, in somebody that has high blood pressure. So even though there are some scoring systems that might say it wasn't even enlarged at all, in my view as a cardiologist, I do believe there was just the smallest uh, element of increased heart thickness. And as I mentioned before, that's important because that's exactly what the heart is supposed to do when there's high blood pressure. That is a normal response. The muscle's getting stronger. It's allowing the heart to work and work well. Now, if that goes on for, like I said before, 20 years, we can have problems. But early on, having a mildly thickened heart is not only a normal finding in someone with high blood pressure, it um, may actually be beneficial in the short term. Doctor, putting all this together, uh, did you see any evidence at all that the primary cause of Mr. Floyd's death originated in his heart? No, I did not. Let's talk about a new subject. Uh, whether or not Mr. Floyd suffered from a drug overdose and died from a drug overdose. Okay. That was something that you also considered as a cause. Yes, sir. Um, were you or are you familiar with Mr. Floyd's toxicology results? Yes, I am. What uh, or which substances did you consider in evaluating uh, Mr. Floyd's toxicology history? Uh, when I looked at the uh, toxicology reports, I focused mostly on the finding of fentanyl as well as the finding of methamphetamines. What role, uh, if any, uh, do you feel that the fentanyl played um, in the cause of Mr. Floyd's death? As far as I can tell from reviewing all of the facts of the case, I see no evidence at all to suggest that a fentanyl overdose caused Mr. Floyd's death. As a as cardiologist, uh, do you occasionally have to care for patients who struggle with opioids or opioid addiction? Absolutely. Um, so here you, you found that the fentanyl, uh, in your opinion, played no role in Mr. Floyd's death. Uh, would you tell us why it is you hold that opinion? How do you reach that conclusion? Well, I think I would break it down to just two major uh, reasonings. Number one, um, it appeared to me that uh, Mr. Floyd, who was an acknowledged um, frequent chronic user of substances, particularly opiates, um, likely developed a high degree of tolerance. Um, there's even one emergency room visit that I had reviewed where 
he came in and he told the emergency room team that you know he was tearful and says I'm having trouble with substance abuse I just took I think he said I took eight Percocets within two hours um, he had no side effects from that at all they observed him for a couple hours and they discharged him um, and just so looking through it looked like he had built up a high tolerance just in general to opiates uh, but the second and just as important maybe more important was I didn't see any of the signs of an opiate overdose um, when I reviewed uh, the, the videos. And, and when you then are referring to the signs of an opiate overdose, uh, would you tell the jurors or describe for them what are those signs and what didn't you see? Sure. So in my experience in the intensive care unit, taking care of patients who come in with an opiate overdose, um, first of all, they are usually extremely lethargic, oftentimes uh, nearly unarousable. And then you try to wake them up and they're falling right back asleep. They're not talking to you. If they are talking to you, they're often having slurred speech. Um, uh, they, um, if they're standing up, which they wouldn't be if they had a fentanyl intoxication and overdose, um, they would have to imagine get pretty dizzy pretty quickly. Um, I kind of saw all the opposite with Mr. Floyd. I saw that he was alert, um, he was awake, uh, he was conversant, he was walking, um, and yet, according to the toxicology report, he had this degree of fentanyl in his system. So just looking at the clinical uh, story, I didn't see any um, signs or symptoms of fentanyl overdose. Let's turn to methamphetamine then. Uh, what role do you feel that methamphetamine, methamphetamine played uh, in Mr. Floyd's cause of death? I feel it played no substantive role at all. And why is that? Well, the, the, all considering it was a very uh, relatively low level of methamphetamine um, in his system. And so when you look at the context of the case and you see a relatively low level of methamphetamine, in the context of everything else, um, I felt very confident that that low degree of methamphetamine was not what was triggering this profound cardiopulmonary arrest and ultimately PEA um, arrest. So Dr. Rich then, taking into account um, all of the evidence that you reviewed, uh, do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether Mr. Floyd's death was preventable? Uh, yes, I do. Would you tell us what that opinion is? Yes, I believe that Mr. George Floyd's death was absolutely preventable. Were there uh, critical points in time during, during his subdual and restraint on the ground uh, when you feel measures could have or should have been taken that would have preserved his life? Uh, yes, I do. I think there were several junctures, actually. Would you tell us about those? Sure. Well, the first, uh, of course, was to not subject him to that initial, uh, that initial um, prone restraint um, uh, positioning that he was subjected to. I mean, that is first and foremost. So if that was not the case, I don't think he would have died. Um, the second, though, was when he was in uh, that uh, subdual and restraint positioning and he was stating repeatedly that he can't breathe. And he was um, getting a little weaker in his speech. Um, there was one moment in the video where I heard one of the officers saying, um, I think he's passing out. Um, that would have been a, um, an opportunity to quickly relieve him from that position of not getting enough oxygen, perhaps turn him into a recovery position and allow him to start to expand his lungs again and bring in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. Um, so in, in, in addition to not putting him in that position in the first place, when there were signs that he was worsening, um, repositioning him, I think very likely would have also saved his life. Was there a point in time, uh, Dr. Rich, uh, when uh, Mr. Floyd was checked for a pulse when he was in the subdual and the restraint of uh, Mr. Chauvin? 
Yes, yes, there was. At the time that uh, he was checked for a pulse and he no longer had one, uh, in your opinion as a cardiologist, was there anything Mr. Chauvin could have done at that point in time that would likely have saved Mr. Floyd's life? Well, at the time that uh, Mr. Floyd is uh, determined to have not had a pulse, uh, what is your opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to what Mr. Chauvin may have done that would have potentially saved his life? Overall, you can give an opinion. Well, just prior to that point, um, I heard one of the officers actually ask, uh, actually on two occasions, um, if Mr. Floyd should be turned on to his side. Uh, and the response was, no, just leave him. And once the officer announced that he did not have a pulse uh, anymore, I think he actually said he does not have one, was the exact words. At that point, the immediate response would then be to not only relieve him of the restraint, but at that point, now you've got to start CPR. You've got to start immediate chest compressions because we know that if you can get to a patient right away, even when they've lost their pulse, even when they've gone into a cardiopulmonary arrest, there is a significant opportunity to save a life. But for every minute that transpires that you are not performing the basic life support and CPR measures, the literature would suggest an approximately 10 to 15 percent less chance of survival. It is why we pour so many resources these days into a community education and training for bystander CPR because it's so effective and it works if the person can be tended to quickly enough. Then from your review of the, the, the video where you could see Mr. Floyd and Mr. Chauvin there on the ground, uh, if, if Mr. Chauvin knew CPR, uh, did you see any reason from your observation that he could not have supplied CPR? Not within the opinion of medical opinion, so that is sustained. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Sustained. Um, all right. It's not a medical opinion, counsel. So at the time then that Mr. Floyd was actually put into the ambulance from the scene, uh, in your opinion as a cardiologist, what would have been the prospects of resuscitating him at that point? Overall, you may give an opinion if you have one. So at that point, I think the chance of meaningful survival unfortunately was very low because I counted the number of minutes that he was on the ground, pulseless, without any CPR. And by the time the paramedics rushed in to get him and to get him onto the stretcher and into the back of the ambulance, um, at that point, a lot of time had passed. Um, I give um, tremendous credit to the efforts of the paramedics and the uh, doctors and nurses in the emergency room. I mean, they worked on him for what seemed... Sustained, this is non-responsive. Dr. Rich, do you have an opinion uh, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether Mr. Floyd uh, would have lived if not for the 9 minutes and 29 seconds of subdual and restraint? Uh, Objection, argument. Overruled if you have an opinion. Uh, let me finish my question for you, uh, Dr. Rich. Do you have an opinion uh, as to whether George Floyd would have lived if not for Mr. Chauvin's subdual and restraint? of him for nine minutes and 29 seconds on the ground. Yeah. So overall, a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Yes, I believe he would have lived. Last question, Dr. Rich. Uh, do you have an opinion as to whether a completely healthy George Floyd, that is, any healthy human being, would have survived this subdual and restraint that Mr. Floyd suffered during the nine minutes and 29 seconds on May 25th of 2020? Objection. It's sustained as irrelevant as to a general person. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sustained. 
Uh, my question for you, Dr. Rich, is would any person, a healthy person, have survived the circumstances or conditions that George Floyd underwent during the nine minutes and 29 seconds on May 25th of last year? Same objection. Sustained. No further questions, Dr. Rich. Thank you. Members of the jury, let's take our 20 minute mid morning recess. Uh, let's come back at 1125. Thank you.
Just a reminder, Doctor, you're still under oath. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, just a few questions for you. Shouldn't take too long. Uh, just to confirm, you're not a pathologist yourself, correct? I'm a cardiologist. And the vast majority of the patients that you treat are in a clinical, clinical setting, correct? Correct. Meaning they're alive generally when they see you? Yeah. All right. Um, can we agree that it is a, a pretty common occurrence? Um, that people die who have uh, arteries that are 90% blocked? No, sir. Well, everyone dies eventually, but not from the 90% blockage. People die every day who have a 90% blockage. People die every day from heart attacks. Well, there's a difference between a heart attack and heart failure, right? Heart attack and heart failure, you are correct, are completely different right. uh, terms. Okay, so um, people who have a 90% blockage may have a cardiac event and may die. As a hypothetical? Yes. Hypothetically, there are undoubtedly people who have died from coronary events with 90% blockages or without blockages. Okay. And people uh, may not experience pain, right, as a result of a an arrhythmia? Correct. And sometimes people have a 90% blockage of the right coronary artery and a 75% blockage of the left anterior descending artery, and they die, right? Again, this is a hypothetical, not, not this case we're talking about. Exactly. Hypothetical. In a hypothetical case, somebody who has any extent of coronary disease, including the descriptions that you just gave could potentially die. Sure. And again, um, they may have no pain associated with a fatal arrhythmia, right? Fatal arrhythmias often are not associated with pain, in fact. You would agree that Mr. Floyd did have coronary artery disease? Absolutely. And how is that normally um, in a living person, how is that normally diagnosed? So usually the patient has symptoms. So they will have chest pain or they're exercising, right? If you're an active person, you shouldn't have chest pain. And if you come to the doctor and say, something's not right, every time I try to exert myself or I try, boy, it feels like the elephant on the chest is the classic description. Um, so that would be one of many possible ways that you would diagnose coronary artery disease in someone who is alive. You may also do a stress test? Sometimes. A blocked right coronary artery that can contribute to a fatal arrhythmia? Any, um, anyone can have a fatal arrhythmia with or without coronary artery disease. And so if a blood vessel is blocked and blood is not getting through that vessel, what happens? Well, it depends, but I'd like to answer that for you. So in the case of Mr. Floyd, what has most likely happened based on our understanding of coronary physiology is precisely because he had a narrowing of up to 90% and it had calcium in it. We know that that developed gradually. And the heart is fascinating in what it does. It develops what's called coronary collaterals, which means the body makes additional blood vessels so that if there's one artery that's narrow, it recruits and builds many more blood vessels to supply blood to the heart. It's actually why you are more likely to die from a heart attack if you started with a lesser narrowed artery and it, the plaque ruptured and blocked the vessel than if you started with a more severe narrowing because of all these unbelievable coronary collaterals and adaptive responses that the heart does when that happens. 
What is a safe dose of methamphetamine? Prescribed? Illicit. I would never consider any illicit drug to be off the street that's not prescribed by a physician to be safe. And methamphetamine is a vasoconstrictor, correct? It often can act as a vasoconstrictor. That means it constricts the blood vessels more, correct? Yeah, that's what, correct. That's what vasoconstriction means, it narrows them down more. You understand, based on the medical records, that there's prior evidence of methamphetamine used by Mr. Floyd? Yes, sir. And methamphetamine um, can cause some changes to the heart in and of itself, correct? Correct. In fact, it sort of ages the heart more, right? I've never used that terminology. Okay. Um, how would you, what does it do to the heart over prolonged use? Every case is different, and it depends what we mean by prolonged use. So one day, one week, 25 years. Um, like most things, if you use something for, if you smoke cigarettes for 50 years, you're gonna have more problems than if you smoked a cigarette or a pack every once in a while. In terms of what does, what does methamphetamine do to the heart itself? So methamphetamine, if used over a long period of time, can sometimes contribute to the development of coronary artery disease, as we've been discussing. Um, it can constrict blood vessels, as you mentioned. Um, it can have kind of a host of different effects on various parts of the body, including the heart. And there's lots of things that can make the heart work harder and faster, right? Sure. I mean, methamphetamine being one of them. Yes. Um, vigorous activity being one of them. Sure. Adrenaline. Yeah, I mean, we all right now have a lot of adrenaline flowing through our system. Adrenaline is needed for life, for sure. Increases in adrenaline can cause the heart to, to work hard, harder and faster? Um, yeah, I mean, so adrenaline, which is the lay term for catecholamines, um, that's the purpose of adrenaline, is to get it to pump more blood. Um, when we go and exercise, the purpose of adrenaline is so we can run and we can jump and we ask the heart to allow us to do that, correct? And um, have you in your practice worked with someone who has a paraganglioma? Um, I have had a couple of patients who have had what we call pho pheochromocytomas, which is a type of paraganglioma, yes. The, in, the, in the hip area generally? No, it's generally it's actually uh, near the adrenal gland, um, which is sort of just near the kidneys, um, but these paragangliomas can sometimes pop up in different places. And how are they typically identified? Well, so it depends. If it was clinically pertinent, um, that's how I diagnosed the ones that I've had, um, the classic findings are the person who's saying, I'm always having headaches. What is with these headaches? I'm always sweating. Why am I always sweating? Um, and you start to say, huh, I wonder if something is releasing um, a hormone that can be contributing to that. Um, other times, like in my opinion, the case here with Mr. Floyd, you'll pick them up incidentally, say at, at an autopsy. Uh, they're also often identified because a person, it, it contributes to high blood pressure. It can, that is right. And you uh, have agreed that you've reviewed the medical records of Mr. Floyd, correct? Correct. And he has a pretty significant history of extremely elevated blood pressures, right? Yes. I think uh, the one you referenced that the top number was over 200. Yeah, uh, on, on, on more, more than one occasion. On more than one occasion. And the lower number of the blood pressure was likewise elevated, right? Yes. Did you observe evidence that Mr. in the medical records that Mr. Floyd was um, taking prescribed medications to control his blood pressure? I saw in the records during an emergency room visit that he was prescribed high blood pressure medication. What I could not see is whether he was taking them or not, but it did look like at one point there was um, a prescription given to him. I think one of them was for amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, and one of them was for um, uh, 
I think either hydrochlorothiazide or chlorthalidone. And you'd agree that the records that you had for Mr. Floyd were relatively limited, agreed? I mean, they, don't, they weren't his entire life medical records. Uh, I don't know when he started to see medical professionals. So I don't, for all I know, the first instance in the records that I saw was the first time he started to see um, medical professionals. I'm not sure. So how many years of past medical records did you review? I believe three or so. I think beginning of 2018 is when I think they started. Are paragangliomas ever removed from a person? Um, paragangliomas, if they are causing those symptoms that I mentioned, the pulsatile headaches, the sweating, et cetera, uh, a surgeon would sometimes remove them. Would you prescribe an amphetamine for somebody who has a 90% blockage of the right coronary artery and a 75% blockage of the left anterior descending artery? So first of all, I don't typically prescribe amphetamines. Um, I have many patients who have coronary artery disease that are on stimulants, okay, um, for a variety of medical conditions. Um, so I just don't prescribe them, but I do have many patients with coronary disease who are on stimulants. Would you recommend to someone that they use methamphetamines with that degree of coronary artery disease? I would never recommend that anybody um, take uh, methamphetamine off the street uh, for any uh, reason. Are you aware of the research showing um, that deaths uh, where both methamphetamine and fentanyl are found, it occurs at a much higher incidence. Can you repeat that question? Sure. Please? Are you aware that the research has demonstrated that deaths of those who are, use methamphetamine and fentanyl have been notably higher than meth, excuse me, meth or fentanyl alone? Objection. The combination. Objection, Your Honor, for lack of foundation uh, to so many facts. Uh, as to assuming facts, that is overruled. Is assuming, uh, is it the scope of his foundation? Since the state did ask him for toxicology opinions. Sure, but the reference to medical articles, uh, none of which anyone has seen, is simply counsel's reference, Your Honor. Overruled. You may answer if you don't. Okay. Um, I, I am not um, familiar with the breadth of the literature uh, looking at all of the different combination of drugs and which combination worsens or improves survival. You testified um, that Mr. Floyd, uh, based on your review of the video, did start complaining of shortness of breath prior to being placed in the prone complaint, prone position, right? Yes, I heard uh, on more than one occasion he, he, he say the words, uh, I can't breathe. And if um, Mr. Floyd had simply gotten in the back seat of the squad car, do you think that he would have survived? Check your honor, I follow the medical testimony. You may give it a me if you have a medical opinion as to that. Overruled to that extent. So, had he not been restrained in the way in which he was, I think he would have survived that day. I think he would have gone home or wherever he was going to go had he not been subjected to the prone and positional restraint that he was. So, in other words, if he had gotten in the squad car, he'd be alive. Um, I think my answer remains the same. Anything other than that scenario that he was subjected to, I have no reason to think from a medical perspective that he would not have survived that day, correct? And in terms of the prone position, you would agree that the prone position is not in and of itself inherently dangerous? In an ordinary individual, if we were to take away everything else that was going on and we and someone was just simply lying in, their, in the prone position, while there are many patients who that would be inherently dangerous, the average individual, I would agree with you, probably just lying flat in that situation generally wouldn't be dangerous. Even in the ICU, there are circumstances where people have serious medical conditions where they're maintained in the prone position, agreed? In the ICU, 
when patients are put into the prone position, it is when it is a desperate attempt to save someone's life where their lungs have actually developed what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. They have a ventilator in to make sure that the amount of air that they get, no matter their positioning, will always be enough. And so it's a funny thing to think about putting someone in the prone positioning in the ICU on a respirator, but because of respiratory physiology, sometimes that will actually help open up certain segments of the lungs that are needed for oxygenation, but it's really important to keep in mind that they are on a respirator every single time to open up those lung airways, and they're usually on sedation as well to keep them comfortable. And my last question, doctor, is after someone, someone's heart stops, is it possible that they continue to respire? Um, it is, well, hmm, I'm not sure I could answer that with certainty other than to say there are these things that are called agonal breaths. So when I'm in the intensive care unit with a patient who is dying and they go into cardiac arrest, um, once in a while you will see them take one or two extra breaths. Um, I'm not sure the exact mechanism or the physiologic trigger for that. Um, so you could potentially see um, some extra breaths um, for a short period of time. By a short period of time, up to a minute? Uh, in, in my experience, if the heart has completely stopped, um, I would not expect to see the breathing continue for up to a minute, but I might expect it to see, be seen for several seconds. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect? Dr. Rich, uh, you were asked uh, several questions that, uh, that had to do, or at least had as a premise, the blockage of Mr. Floyd's arteries. Uh, is blockage a proper medical term to you as a cardiologist to describe the narrowing in Mr. Floyd's arteries? So when we try to use a terminology that is not medical terminology, right, to explain these phenomena, um, the term blockage um, I tend to use when the blood vessel is completely blocked. It, it, there's a blockage. Um, I will usually describe, if I have a patient like Mr. Floyd, um, who has coronary artery disease like this, I will usually use the term narrowings because the blood is still getting through. In fact, the blood may be getting through just fine. Um, there is no level of narrowing, in fact. Even a totally blocked artery, this is what's fascinating, that develops over time, the territory of blood that that blood vessel was supposed to supply can still be getting enough blood because of those collateral vessels that develop. So I would use the term with Mr. Floyd as narrowings. You were asked questions again about paragangliomas. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I think you told us that those are usually uh, preceded by headaches of some kind. Classically correct. One of the symptoms is headaches. Yes, that is right. Uh, again, did you hear amongst the various complaints Mr. Floyd may have had about pain, did you hear any of them being a headache? No. In fact, when I saw that there was a paraganglioma described as an incidental finding in the autopsy report, I actually, when I went to the medical records, I used that control F button to put in headache and make sure that I never found headache in addition to scrolling through all the records. I didn't find headaches at any point. Uh, when you referenced paraganglioma para being an incidental finding on the autopsy, uh, would you tell the jury what's meant by incidental? Ah, sure. So all of us have things in our bodies that aren't causing any medical problems. Um, but if they're discovered, let's say someone gets a CAT scan for one reason, they might find that there's a cyst on the kidney or the liver. Sometimes we'll even pick up uh, benign tumors. So we refer to those as incidental findings. It, in fact, in the case of uh, paraganglioma, 
the name you would actually call it is an incidental loma um, because we don't think it has clinical relevance, but it was found and described in the imaging, or in this case, the autopsy. Are you familiar with any of the data as to how many people in the United States have ever died as a paraganglioma as the principal or primary reason for death? To be honest, I don't know the exact numbers. I just know that they are very low. Now, you were asked questions about um, high blood pressure, the role and impact of uh, methamphetamine, paraganglioma, narrowing arteries. Can any of those things in, of, and by themselves cause someone to die without first injuring the heart? Um, can you repeat the question? Yes, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at, whether we talk about high blood pressure, methamphetamine, paraganglioma, and the impact on the adrenals, narrowing of the arteries, uh, can any of those things by themselves cause a person to die without first impacting uh, the stoppage of the heart? Well, the reason I ask you to ask the question again is because I want to make sure that I'm precise and clear here. Um, high blood pressure can cause death in manners outside of the heart. For example, it can contribute to a stroke, which we know Mr. Floyd didn't have. And the other thing that can occasionally happen is this thing called an aortic dissection, where the uh, aorta, the main tube that leads the heart, can tear, that can cause death. So I want to make absolutely clear, these conditions can cause death on occasion in areas not involving the heart, but most of the time, if death is going to occur by them, it's going to be caused because of their impact on the heart. And did Mr. Floyd have an aortic dissection? No, he absolutely did not based on the review of the autopsy. He didn't have a stroke? He also did not have a stroke. So again, just to be clear for the jury with all the discussion about the narrowing of arteries, meth, et cetera, uh, was there any damage at all observed to Mr. Floyd's heart muscle? Based on my review of all of the evidence, the EKGs, the autopsy report, I found absolutely no evidence at all of heart damage in Mr. Floyd's heart. Thank you, Dr. Rich. Sure. Any read crowds? On redirect, you were asked a question about the various, the paraganglioma, the coronary heart disease, high blood pressure, if any one of those can cause uh, death independently and you answered relevant to the high blood pressure, right? But you would agree that when you combine a lot of that, you would agree that the body is, a lot of things are happening at the same time, right? Yeah. Um, and in combination, if you have a paraganglioma, you've got an increase in the fight or flight kind of response. You've got um, coronary heart disease, you've got high blood pressure, all of those things combined could cause death, even if there was not a physical restraint. Well, there's his paraganglioma. The likelihood that his paraganglioma was even releasing any hormone is highly unlikely. But in terms of the combination, the, the drugs, every, the high blood pressure, the take the paraganglioma out of it, right? The increase in adrenaline from... Uh, a struggle with officers. All of those things to combine together, even in the absence of prone restraint, could have resulted in death. Yes upon, or no, sir? Upon my review of the evidence and the facts of the case, I found no evidence to support that. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. You are excused. Thank you. <coughs> And we have our next witnesses at 1.30, is that correct? All right, we have two witnesses for this afternoon, uh, members of the jury, and uh, counsel and I have to finish up some legal issues at 1. So we're going to break until 1.30. Have a good lunch.
All right, we're on the record. Uh, this is in regard to the motion this morning to either allow or deny admission of Mr. Hall's question and answer statement given on an earlier occasion. I've had a chance to review the transcript of that as well as case law. First of all, denying the defense motion to have the prosecution give an offer of proof or an explanation for why they are not uh, granting immunity. I think even as the super case cited by the defense notes, immunity, the grant of immunity is strictly an executive branch function. It's not really subject to judicial review. And so regardless of what the state's reason was for refusing to give immunity to Mr. Hall, is not reviewable by this court. So the request that the state provide a reason for uh, not granting use immunity is denied. With regard to the statement given by Mr. Hall, and this assumes that he is not going to be answering any questions even if I order him to do so, I'm going to find that none of the statements in the question and answer statement are admissible. Uh, first of all, in Johnson versus Fabian, that noted the basic standard for a Fifth Amendment claim and how broad it is, and it tends to be much broader than 804b3. Under the Fifth Amendment, uh, answers that would in them themselves support a conviction or that would furnish a link in the chain of evidence needed to prosecute the claimant are incriminating for purposes of the privilege. And in fact, in discussing that, that was from Johnson versus Fabian, which is 735 Northwest 2nd, 295, which was cited by the state. They also note that the privilege allows an individual to refuse to answer official questions put to him in any other proceeding, civil or criminal, formal or informal, where the answers might incriminate him in future criminal proceedings. That standard is obviously uh, fairly broad. And so if it might incriminate the defendant or provide a link to other evidence that might incriminate, the invocation of the Fifth Amendment privilege is appropriate. In contrast, 804b3 states, in part, pertinent part states, a statement which was at the time of its making so far tended to subject the declarant to civil or criminal liability that a reasonable person in the declarant's position would not have made the statement unless believing it to be true. In other words, if somebody goes into the police department and confesses to a murder, generally people don't do that because, unless it's true, because it so clearly tends to subject the declarant to criminal liability. And that is judged from the time of the statement's making. And the statements that are contained in the question and answer statement are in fact not the type that would clearly be so far contrary to the declarant's penal interest or subject that person to criminal liability that they would not make them unless true. Most importantly, for example, Mr. Hill totally denies providing uh, controlled substances to George Floyd. Uh, he talks about how he was appearing tired and all that, but the entire uh, statement seems to be Mr. Hall describing what does not incriminate him. He's willing to do that, but when it comes to anything that he might have done, uh, he denies engaging in any activity like dealing. There are some sporadic references to dealing on the street, but there's nothing specific as to time, date, location, persons involved, that the person would be subjecting themselves clearly to criminal liability. Accordingly, it does not fall under 804b3. Under 807, a statement not specifically covered by uh, Rule 803 or 804 may be admitted, but it must have equivalent circumstantial guarantees of trustworthiness. I see nothing internally within the question and answer statement uh, that Mr. Hall's statements uh, had any guarantees of trustworthiness, and accordingly, it is not admissible under the rule for that reason. The defense does have a, uh, a right to a complete defense, but since there are 
witnesses who can testify as to what uh, and have testified as what Mr. Floyd looked like at the time. I don't think that the rules of evidence must give way completely to any claim of it. this evidence is necessary for a complete defense. I find it is not, and accordingly it is not admissible. Any questions about that ruling from the state or from the defense? All right. Uh, we have other housekeeping things, but we'll uh, handle those after the jury, unless you wanted to take care of some of those now. We can do that after, because we're going to be done before 4 o'clock. Is that correct? All right. Why don't we deal with the housekeeping things and that afterwards? All right. We'll be in recess until the jury's ready. Maybe we can get them out maybe in five minutes. Will your witnesses be available? All right. Let's look at uh, Rita Vitti in five minutes.
statement. Call us the next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Philonis Floyd. Hold on. Hold on. If you could wait out in the hallway just for a second, Council Cyber. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. And, sir, if you would feel comfortable doing so, if you could remove your mask, that would be great. And we're going to test out the microphone. First, have you state your full name, spelling each of your names. Malonis O'Neill Floyd, P H I L. O N I S E O'Neill O N E I L Floyd F L O Y D. Mr. Slisher. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sir, uh, you're here to testify about your brother, uh, George Floyd. Is that right? Yes, sir. And before uh, you tell the jury uh, about your brother, I'd like you to introduce yourself to the jury a little bit so they know something about you. Uh, are you, uh, how old are you? 39. Was George your older or younger brother? He was my oldest brother. Okay. Uh, are you married? Yes, sir. And do you have children? Yes, sir. How many children do you have? Two. And sir, where do you, uh, what state do you live in? Houston, Texas. Okay. Uh, I'd like you to tell the jury a little bit about your brother, George Floyd. First, can you tell the jury uh, where and when he was born? He was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, but he left uh, at a young age. Um, he, we uh, moved like uh, to Houston, Texas, and uh, I have two other sisters that are older than us. It's Jaja Floyd, Latonya Floyd, then became George Floyd, and I'm next Falonis Floyd, and my other brother Rodney Floyd, who's my mom's baby boy. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, was he born on October 14, 1973? Yes, sir. And you say that he, uh, the family left uh, Fayetteville uh, shortly after he was born, is that right? Yes, sir. And you all grew up in Houston together? We all grew up in Houston. Uh, who are George's parents? Uh, Larsenia, Larsenia Floyd, Larsenia Jones Floyd, and his father was George Perry Floyd Sr. Right. And did Larsenia, is that your mother? That's my mother, but uh, they called her Miss Sissy. Miss Sissy. Yes. Sir. Who called her Miss Sissy? Uh, everybody called her Miss Sissy. Uh, we just called her mom, uh, but everybody around the neighborhood called her Miss Sissy. Any, anybody that knew her called her that, and that was that. They had to be like 50 years of age, but everybody younger than that called her mom. That was George's age. Everybody called her mom because she was a mom to so many people in the community. What community uh, was that? That was in Third Ward, and I grew up in the CUNY Home Housing Authority projects. Uh, it was low income, poverty. So, uh, we stayed with each other all the time. Me and me and George, we grew up together playing video games a lot. Uh, his favorite game was on Nintendo. We played Double Dribble and we played Tecmo Bowl. 
and I finally beat him in a game and I was just so happy just thinking about about that and he reset the game and would say come on let's play again and I'd be like no all I gotta go do our chores now let me do my chores but George also he used to make the best banana mayonnaise sandwiches and he used to make syrup sandwiches because George couldn't cook he couldn't boil water so and also if you well, if you all were there in our house you'll see George had lines on the wall because he will always measure with his height trying to see how tall he is because he wanted to be taller all the time because he loved sports so he always wanted to be the best and I'm going to interrupt you for a, for a mm -hmm. moment. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to show the witness uh, what's been marked for identification as Exhibit 284. Uh, do you recognize uh, the picture in 284? Yes, sir. Is yes. that a picture of your mother and George when he was younger? Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm going to offer Exhibit 284. Okay. 284 is received. Permission to publish. Sir, would you please describe uh, this photo and what you know about it? That's, that's my mother. She's no longer with us right now, but that's, that's my oldest brother, George. I miss both of them. They are. I was married. In May 24th, I got married. And my brother was killed. May 25th, and my mom died on May 30th. So it's like a, a bittersweet month because I'm supposed to be happy when that month comes. Right, sir, I'm going to uh, ask you some questions about uh, your mom's passing a little bit. If you need a moment, I can take a minute and just let me know when you're ready. Okay. Going back to growing up in the in the, in the CUNY homes, uh, can you please tell the jury what role um, George Floyd had as a, as the older brother in that household? He was so much of a, a leader to us in the household. He would always make sure that we had our clothes for school. He made sure that we all were going to be uh, to school on time. And like I told you, George couldn't cook, but he'll make sure you have a snack or something to get in the morning. But he uh, he was one of those people in the community that when they had church outside, people would attend church just because he was there. Nobody would go out there until they seen him. And he just was like a, a person that everybody loved around the community. He. He just knew how to make people feel better. And sir, you indicated, uh, well, first you aware of where uh, George Floyd went to school. Mm -hmm. He went to school at uh, Blackshear Elementary, and from Blackshear it was Ryan Middle School, and from Ryan it was Jack Gates High School, where he excelled in sports and basketball and football. He was... He had uh, received a scholarship to attend South Florida College, and from there, he played basketball there, and he transferred to Texas A&M Kingsville, where he played football. All right. Now, uh, I'd like to show the witness uh, Exhibit 285 for identification. Sir, do you recognize what's shown in Exhibit 285? Yes, sir. Is that a picture of your brother when he was at the Jack Yates High School in Houston? Yes, sir. Yeah. Offer Exhibit 285. Any objection? No, no. 285 is received. And permission to publish. Approximately how old uh, would George Floyd have been when this picture was taken? It's like, it looked like, like 18 or 17 at that time. And you talked about um, uh, basketball and playing basketball. Uh, if I can show Exhibit 287 to the witness. 87, 287. Thank you. All right, showing you what's been marked for identification is Exhibit 287. Uh, do you recognize this photo? 
Yes, sir. Is there a picture of your brother in this photo? Yeah, uh, he's number five, uh, South Florida, all the way in the left-hand corner. All right, I'm going to offer Exhibit 287. Any objection? 287 is received. And permission to publish. All right, you indicated that your brother was number five. On the, is that on the far yes. left? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, w w South Florida, uh, was that a community college? South Florida was a community college. Um, I'm, I'm looking at it. I noticed a whole bunch of the ball players because I met a lot of them coming up. Did, uh, did George Floyd uh, maintain you know, his uh, level of fitness and love of basketball throughout his life? Yes, sir. He, he loved the workout. He loved playing basketball. Um, people, he loved teaching people the game of basketball. Uh, that's, to me, where I really uh, learned how to play from him because he guided a lot of guys on the court and showed them what they need to do mm -hmm, to be better. And when he would talk about playing basketball, would he use any particular term or phrase? Oh, he uh, said, hey, man, let's go hooping. And we will always say, come on, let's go. Um, we always went hooping. And uh, you, have to, you have to hoop every day because if you don't go and shoot a whole bunch of shots, like 50 to 100 shots a day, um, my brother will always say, you'll never be able to compete. And hooping was big. Because Magic, you had to watch the stars. We watched Michael. We watched Magic. We watched everybody who, every day. And uh, if you could take that down, you indicated that um, George Floyd was also interested in, in football, or had a passion for football. Is that right? Yes, sir. Would he play catch with you? He would play catch with us. It's funny how I always thought that my brother couldn't throw, but he never intended to throw the ball to me. He will always throw it at an angle while I have to go chase it and jump for it or dive for it. And I came up to him one day, I said, man, I said, I see why you play tight end and stuff because you can't throw it all. And he was like, I don't want to throw the ball to you because if I throw it to you, you'll never understand you have to go get the ball. He said, the ball should never come to you. You should always tell yourself, I'm going to go get the football because you have to attack the ball. That's what he told me. Sir, was your uh, brother uh, a father? Yes, sir. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as Exhibit 290, just to the witness. Uh, do you recognize what's shown in Exhibit 290? Yes, sir. Is that a picture of your brother with his daughter? Yes, sir. Offer Exhibit 290. Any objection? Yeah. 290 is received. And permission to publish. Uh, and what's uh, his daughter's name? Gianna. How old is she now? Seven. Sir, could you please, for the jury, uh, describe George Floyd's relationship with his mother? Oh, it was it was one of a kind. Uh, George, he would always be up on our mom. He was a big mama's boy. Um, I cry a lot, but George, she loved his mom. He will always just be up on her. And, you know, every mother loves all of her kids, but it was so unique how they were with each other. He would lay, just lay up on her in the fetus position like he was still in a womb. Um, I would see him every day, and I'd say, period. I'd say, period, because we called him period instead of George. And he would always say, hold on, let me kiss mama before I come over there. And being around him, he showed us like uh, how to treat our mom and how to respect our mom. He, he just, he loved her so dearly. And when George, he had uh, found out that my mom was past him because she had to stay with us for hospice and he was talking to her over the phone but she perished before he even came down here so that right there it, it hurt him a lot and when we went to the funeral it's just George just sat there at the casket over and over again he would just say mama mama over and over again and I didn't know what to tell him because I was in pain too.
we all were hurting. And he was just kissing her. And just kissing her. He didn't want to leave the cast. And everybody was like, come on. Come on, it's going to be okay. But it was, it was just difficult because no, I don't know who can take that when you watch your mother, somebody who loves and cherish you and nourish you for your entire life. And then they have to leave you. We all have to go through it, but it's difficult. And George, he was he was just in pain the entire time. Sir, you indicated your mother passed away May 30. That was 2018. Is that right? Yes, sir. And uh, you described um, seeing your brother George uh, at the funeral. Is that right? Yes, sir. And was was around the time of your mother's passing the last time you saw your brother George Floyd in person alive? Yes, sir. Did you maintain contact with him uh, on the phone, uh, through text and whatnot after that? Yeah, we uh, text, uh, we called each other. Um, he would call and I would call him, but we would talk a lot of times early in the morning because I was a truck driver. So he will always be up talking to me and getting pointers on how to back up, um, how to do this, shifting gears, different things like that. And I had great teachers, so I would also just explain to him what he needed to do. And that level, to get to that next tier, that's what he would do. He would just listen. And he became a student. And I always had to ask him for advice because it was my big brother. Uh, sir, and this is a, a yes or no question, were you informed that your brother George Floyd died on May 26, 2020? Yes, sir. Oh. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I have no further questions, Your Honor. Any questions? Your Honor, I have no questions. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for being Let me make sure he's here, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, the state calls Seth Stoughton. Swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Go ahead, see, please. Thank you. And if you could remove your mask if you're comfortable doing so. Yes, sir. And let's begin by having you state your full name, spelling each of your names. My name is Seth Wayne Stoughton, S E T H W A N E. S T O U G H T O N. Mr. Slisher. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, how are you employed? I am an associate professor at the University of South Carolina School of Law and an affiliate professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. How long have you been a law professor? I've been there for seven years now, almost seven years and uh, two years prior to that in a teaching fellowship preparing to be a law professor. Okay. And do you te teach academic courses uh, at the South Carolina Law School? I do. What courses do you teach? I teach criminal law, criminal procedure, a regulation of vice seminar, and police law and policy. Uh, do you also conduct any scholarly research? I do, yes. What uh, scholarly research do you conduct? I study the regulation of policing, and multiple aspects of the regulation of policing. Okay. Now I'd like you to please describe your educational background to the jury so they can understand how you uh, 
come to be a law professor at the University of South Carolina. First, where did you receive your undergraduate education? Florida State University in Tallahassee. And what was your degree? English, with a focus in literature. And uh, before we get into your uh, law career, uh, did you take a, have you always been in academia? No, I have not. Okay. What was your prior career before being, becoming involved in academia? I interrupted my undergraduate education to take a job as a police officer with the Tallahassee Police Department, and then later as an investigator with the Florida Department of Education's Office of Inspector General. I'd like you to please describe for the jury uh, your experience as an officer with the Tallahassee Police Department. First, uh, what year did you join the department? I applied to the department in 2000 and was employed in early 2001. Can you describe for the jury the, the training process that you went through to become a police officer in the state of Florida? Sure. So Florida has a academy requirement. I went to a regional police academy, which means not an academy run by my particular agency, but instead an academy that trains officers from a number of agencies in North Florida. After finishing the approximately five, five and a half months or so of academy training, I went through additional uh, pre-service training at my agency, about a month of classroom training and additional um, sort of lecture style training and hands-on training, and then went through uh, four, four months, three and a half months of a field training program. And after you completed your field training, you received assignment, an assignment as a law enforcement officer in Tallahassee. Yes, I did. I'd like you to please describe for the jury at kind of a high level the different assignments you had as a police officer with that department. I was there full time for just under five years. The entire time I was there, I worked on patrol. That was our uniformed capacity officers who were responding to calls for service or uh, pulling over vehicles and the like. I had some additional assignments as a patrol officer. I spent about two years on our special response team. I taught community self-defense classes and child abduction and molestation prevention classes in the community and the like. And as a patrol officer, were you ever in a situation where you had to uh, use force on an individual? Yes. You ever have to arrest somebody? Yes. Handcuff a reluctant sub subject? Yes something that you would routinely do as a police officer. Yes. Did you respond to calls for service and write police reports? Yes, lots of calls for service and lots of reports. Right. Uh, after you left the uh, Tallahassee Police Department, you took a job with, was it the Department of Education? Yes, Florida's Department of Education as an investigator in their Inspector General's office. Please describe your general duties there. So as an investigator, I was charged with investigating waste, fraud, and abuse within and affecting the Department of Education. The investigations were both administrative, for example, sexual harassment allegations within the Department of Education, and also criminal, uh, private school tuition voucher fraud primarily, although there were some other uh, non-tuition voucher fraud criminal cases that I was involved in. Um, when did you decide to go to law school and enter enter law school? Having put my undergraduate education on hold, uh, as, a, as an investigator, I now had a regular, regular day job, so I was able to finish that degree. Uh, it took me 10 years to get a four-year degree, because I can be a little slower than the average bear sometimes. As I was coming up on the end of that degree, the, I, we made the decision, my wife and I made the decision to go to law school to continue to expand career options. Where did you attend law school? The University of Virginia. And what year did you graduate from law school? 2011. Okay. And at what point did you enter uh, academia, generally? I clerked for a year after law school. I worked for a federal judge um, based out of Indiana for the year after law school. I then began my academic fellowship uh, after that clerkship. Okay. And in your academic pursuits, did you decided to build on the experience that you had as a, as a former police officer? Yes. How so? As I began law school, I really had no intention of becoming an academic, and I had some outstanding professors, and uh, between their influence 
and my interest in studying policing from an academic and a legal perspective, um, I realized there was a little bit of a niche where I could draw on some of the information that I had from firsthand experience to either ask questions that other academics maybe had not asked or to find answers in different places that other academics may not have thought to look. And is that where you've focused your research? Yes, all of my research has been on policing and the regulation of policing. Uh, have you authored any uh, uh, scholarly uh, publications? Yes. And what sort of publications have you authored? Um, I have written uh, law review articles, which is the academic, the type of academic journal that legal scholars publish in. Um, I've written for a number of different uh, publishers, a number of different articles on a range of topics, um, officers and off-duty employment, um, the use of force, uh, tactics, uh, different ways that aspects of our legal system regulate um, police officers and affect officer behaviors. Have you authored uh, chapters of books? Yes, I have. What uh, books, what publications have you authored chapters of? I think my most recent publication was um, in Critical Issues in Policing, which is a series of contemporary essays on policing. That, uh, that chapter is on the regulation of police violence. I've authored book chapters on police misconduct and uh, I'm authoring another one on use of force review right now. Uh, you published a, a, a book recently, is that right? With, uh, you co-authored uh, a book, is that right? Yes, I did. And what's the title of the book? That's uh, Evaluating Police Uses of Force. All right, and you have a copy with you here. I do. You, you co-authored that book uh, with uh, Jeffrey Noble and uh, Jeffrey Alpert, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So are you a member of any uh, professional organizations? I am, yes. What professional organizations uh, are you a member of? I'm an associate member of the Virginia Bar, which is a non-practicing member of the State Bar Association for Attorneys. I'm a member of the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing, a member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. I serve as an advisor to the American Law Institute's Principles of the Law on Policing. I'm a member, uh, or I believe technically a liaison to the American Bar Association's Working Group on Trust in the Criminal Justice System. There are probably a couple of other ones. I, I don't remember all them all offhand. Do you occasionally uh, provide consultation to uh, law enforcement agencies uh, in conducting use of force reviews through these organizations? Um, not through the professional organizations, but I do work with, uh, consult, or do research with police agencies, yes. Uh, does that include uh, providing educational instruction? Yes. Consultation? Yes, it has. And specific use of force reviews? Uh, it has, yes. And what agencies have you done that kind of work with? I've done a training presentation to the training uh, officers in the Richland County Sheriff's Office, which is, I believe, the largest um, law enforcement association, largest law enforcement agency in South Carolina. I'm a member of the Civilian Advisory Council with my local police department, the Columbia Police Department. So I sit in what are called command review boards, which can involve assessing use of force in that context. I've done presentations and training at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, which is not an agency per se, but um, the audience had representatives of a number of different um, state, local, and federal agencies. I've provided training and presentations to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives uh, senior staff, to the command staff of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Um, I've, all of those are sort of formal, there might be a couple of others, as well as a range of informal consultations and discussions on a range of issues with a number of agencies. And are you a frequent speaker or lecturer on issues of policing and uses of force uh, throughout the country? Uh, yes, although in the past year most of those have been presentations from my home via Zoom, but yes, they, they are based all over the place. What organizations do you present to? Oh, um, I've presented well over 100 times at this point to organizations that include the American Judges Association, the Conference of Chief Justices, uh, judicial 
conferences in a number of states, prosecution or defense conferences in a number of states, uh, security conference in Mexico City, um, a prosecution and defense combined conference in Canada. Um, most recently, I've presented at several uh, law reviews and symposiums, one hosted by the University of, uh, no, I'm sorry, by Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, that was this past week by the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology. That was the week before, I believe, um, by the University of Wisconsin, Plattsville. Um, that was also in this past week. Right. Have you previously been retained as an expert witness? Yes, I have. How often have you been retained as an expert witness? I've been retained around 60 times at this point. Okay. Have you testified as an expert witness before uh, at the deposition? Uh, yes, I have. Okay. Approximately how many times? Uh, at deposition, I think over a dozen pretty easily at this point, I believe. And in those depositions, have you testified as an expert witness in the area of use of force? Uh, yes, tactics, use of force, police procedure, yes. Have you testified uh, at a trial uh, before as an expert in use of force? Yes, I have. Uh, uh, um, use of force, including uh, tactics and, and use of force related issues, yes. What courts have you testified in? There was a federal court in North Carolina, a federal court in South Carolina, a criminal court in Georgia. I think that's it for trial testimony. As, as you know, most of these, um, most cases don't actually make it to a trial. Yep. And you were talking about um, depositions. Those are civil cases, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. All right. Now, you've been retained in this matter to provide uh, testimony regarding the use of force uh, that occurred on May 25, 2020 in the matter of the death of George Floyd. Is that correct? Yes, I have. Okay. And having been retained, you charge a fee for your services? Uh, for my time in review, yes. All right. Uh, what, what is your fee, your hourly rate? Uh, $295 an hour in this case. And uh, you receive a different rate uh, for trial days? I have a um, eight hour minimum on days I'm expected to testify, yes. Okay. And uh, to date, uh, how much have you been compensated based on your on your work in this case? I'd, I would have to look at my records to see what actual compensation has been. Um, in the in the area of maybe twenty four or twenty five thousand dollars received. Uh, how many hours do you would you estimate that you've put into uh, preparing for this matter? Um, including both compensated and uncompensated hours, I'm probably in the. This might be overestimating slightly, but in the 130 to 140 hour range. Now, uh, in your experience as an expert witness, uh, have you always reached a conclusion that's favorable to the party who hires you? Uh, no. Why is that? Uh, because the facts and my review of the facts did not favor them. So my, my credibility is very important to me. And if I am retained and develop an opinion that does not favor the attorney who retains me, um, that's still my opinion. 
Now, did you actively seek to participate in this matter? No. Uh, who contacted you? Uh, the state of Minnesota. Based upon uh, in, in your retention uh, with the state of Minnesota, have you developed uh, opinions regarding the use of force against George Floyd on the date of his death? Uh, yes, and related activity, yes. I'd like you to please explain to the jury first the, the process by which you go about reaching conclusions, analyzing cases such as this. Sure. So the first step is to get and go through the material. In this case, I believe I got an external hard drive that had uh, tens of thousands of pages of documentation, I believe close to or over 40,000 pages of documentation, uh, a large number of videos, uh, including a number of body-worn camera videos, including the body-worn camera videos of the officers who were involved in this particular incident. Those would include the body-worn camera videos of, of the defendant, is that right? Yes. And uh, Officer Tao, Officer King, and Officer Lane? Yes. Uh, did you also review some bystander videos, uh, Darnella Frazier, for example? Yes, um, her her video, uh, Ms. Hansen's video, a video taken from uh, across the street by a bystander, I think, in a in a Speedway gas station, uh, a, a traffic cam or uh, a, a pole camera mounted um, somewhere up up above. Um, yes, a, a number of videos. As an individual who uh, frequently reviews uh, uses of force, are you commonly called upon to review body-worn camera footage and other footage such as surveillance or bystander video? Yes. Um, in fact, one of my academic publications uh, is specifically about body-worn cameras, and I've done a, a great deal of um, both research and teaching on using video footage, interpreting video uh, footage, especially in use of force cases. If you could please uh, describe to the jury just the, the uh, I guess the depth of body-worn camera footage you were able to view in this case as compared to one in which you might have just a single uh, recording. Yeah, sure. It's, it's pretty common for uh, a use of force to only involve an officer or two um, to involve very limited video, maybe only the video from that particular officer. And body-worn camera or any video footage is just one more piece of evidence that I, in conducting a review, have to examine and weigh and measure against other pieces of evidence. In this case, unlike the vast majority of cases that I've been involved in, there were a whole bunch of videos. So uh, videos from different perspectives of the same event that can allow a much more robust understanding of what was going on. To put it very simply, one camera only captures what's available on that camera, so I don't see what's happening off camera. But when I have multiple videos from multiple perspectives, multiple angles, it allows me to get a much better sense of what's happening when and where. So uh, using some examples, you examined the, uh, the Frasier video, is that right? Yes. And uh, you were also able to view the Alicia Finari, the Speedway employee's video as well, correct? Yes, that's correct. And, and then uh, at the same time, view the Milestone video, the larger overview. Yes, that's the pole camera video, uh, I think on top or, or near the top of the Speedway. And can you describe to the jury the, the different perspectives that you were able to see using each of those videos and how the viewing of one aided the understanding of the other? Sure. So uh, very simply, the Miss um, Frazier's video was taken from the sidewalk near the squad, near the police vehicle. And you really don't see officers Lane or King on that video. On the other hand, from the perspective across the street at the speedway uh, or the pole camera, you do see those officers. It's simply because the camera isn't obstructed by the police vehicle. Now, uh, did you, uh, upon your review of all the videos, the documents that you discussed, uh, uh, complete a report memorializing your findings? Yes, I did, my findings and opinions. About how long was that report? The report total, I believe, was close to 300 pages. That includes um, a rather lengthy appendix that lists out all of the materials that I reviewed. The body of the report itself, which has my um, summary of the relevant facts and my opinions, uh, was, uh, I think, about 112 pages. 
110 pages if we take out the table of contents, maybe over 100 pages. All right. And you did you rely on your training uh, and your experience uh, and, and uh, academic experience to review the evidence in this case and reach your conclusions? Yes. And have you reached your opinions to a degree of reasonable professional certainty based on generally accepted standards in, in your field? Yes, I have. Now, before sharing those opinions, sir, I would like you to please explain you know, what factors you review when you're evaluating uses of force. Sure. So first, as sort of a threshold point, I have to know what I'm actually looking at, right? I have to know which uses of force I'm actually reviewing. Um, for example, if an officer is involved in a shooting, the saying is the officer has to account for every bullet that they put downrange. That is, they might they, they count as separate uses of force. After I identify what the uses of force are, then I apply essentially a four-step analytical framework. First, I identify what the relevant facts and circumstances are as viewed through the lens of a reasonable officer on the scene. Then I assess the threat, if any, presented by the individual's actions. Then I assess the foreseeable effects of the officer's use of force. And then the fourth step is sort of putting all of that together and assessing whether, in light of the facts and circumstances, the foreseeable effects of the officer's use of force were justified and reasonable because they were proportional and appropriate in light of the threat presented by the individual's actions. By what standard are you making this assessment? So the, the ultimate analytical question, that, that uh, step four, is applying generally accepted police practices, what we might call a national or professional standard for the way we expect and the way policing uh, expects officers to engage with individuals and use force. And what are these national standards based on? So a combination of things. They're certainly influenced by constitutional law, for example, uh, by history and research in policing. Since the 1970s or so, there's been um, tactical research within policing that's helped inform uh, what we would now consider generally accepted practices, um, a great deal of evidence and experience as well. Uh, are there constitutional standards as well? Yes, constitutional law, especially the Fourth Amendment standard, is one of the factors that um, defines or certainly influences the generally accepted practices. Is, is another influence uh, a particular department's uh, policies and training? Uh, an agency's policies or training uh, might, and indeed I would hope they are, um, reflective of the generally accepted practices, but we can't define industry-wide generally accepted practices by looking at a particular agency's policies or training. So the standard you're reviewing is that of reasonableness? That's correct. Um, now, we might look at a large number of agencies and say, okay, if hundreds or many, many police agencies are doing this thing, then maybe that's a best practice or a generally accepted practice. But you can't just look at one agency and say, it's reasonable because this one agency said it was reasonable. All right. Um, when discussing the constitutional standards, you're familiar with the standards set forth in Graham versus Connor? I am, yes. And uh, you have a demonstrative, uh, I believe it's uh, Exhibit uh, 954. And if I can publish that, the Graham factors. Okay. 954 is received for demonstrative purposes only. And can you just please uh, tell the jury um, the, what, it, what it is you see here? So this is a summary of what are referred to as the Graham factors. These are specific factors identified by the Supreme Court in the case Graham v. Connor that we use really in that second phase of analysis. The second step, remember, is uh, assessing the threat presented by the individual's actions. And... To understand uh, Graham v. Connor, kind of have to understand what we mean by threat. Um, first, when we're talking about the threat that an individual may present, it's not some abstract notion. It's not general threat or conceptual. It's specific threat 
of something, right? Someone who's running away may present a threat of escape or a threat of assaulting an officer or the like. And further, we can define threat. We know that threat exists when the individual has the physical ability and the opportunity and the apparent intention to cause whatever specific harm we're analyzing. So for example, um, imagine someone who's just standing there with nothing in their hands. They don't have the physical ability to hit an officer with a tire iron. So there's no threat that an officer is going to be hit with a tire iron. There's just no physical ability there. On the other hand, imagine someone who has a tire iron but who's 50 feet away. They have the physical ability because they have a tire iron but they don't have any opportunity. They're too far away in that moment to actually present a threat. And then we could imagine someone who has a tire iron and they're two or three feet away from an officer, but they're changing a tire at the time. They have the ability and the opportunity, but there's nothing about that interaction, as the officer is talking with them, that suggests they have the apparent intention to cause that particular threat. So when you put all of those three things together, ability, opportunity, and intention, that's how we identify threat. The Graham Conner, uh, I'd, I'd like you to contrast that with risk. Oh, sure. Um, so threat, as I've defined it, can be contrasted with risk. Risk you can think of as a potential threat. That person with the tire iron who's 50 feet away they don't present a threat. If they get close enough, they might have the opportunity now or the apparent intention to strike an officer with a tire iron, but they don't yet. So risk is something that officers can use tactics and communication to help address. The goal is to prevent risk from becoming threat and really to prevent threat from becoming whatever that relevant harm is. Uh, but while threat can justify use of force, risk can't. An officer can't use force on someone who's holding a tire iron and two or three feet away while they're just changing a tire because there's no apparent intention, there's no threat there. The officer can do something like back away, build distance so they aren't two or three feet away, or interpose the vehicle between themselves and the individual they're interacting with or use communications. They could uh, ask the individual to put the tire iron down, but they can't use force there because there's no threat. The I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, this is what you get for having a law professor testify. And about. they're trying so hard to take notes and court reporters trying to take things down, so I'm gonna slow you down a little bit if I may, professor. Sure, sorry. Oh, no problem. Um, uh, then in Assessing other potential risk factors, would you agree that the relative size of a person is a risk factor? It's certainly a relevant consideration, yes. Uh, but is it in and of itself a threat? Uh, no, certainly not. Um, someone who's physically large may have a greater physical ability to uh, inflict harm if they assault an officer, but that their size can't establish opportunity and can't establish intention. And uh, how about a recent drug use? Is that a threat or a risk? Again, it's a relevant consideration, but it does not in and of itself establish a threat. Um, it doesn't establish physical ability by itself to do anything. It doesn't establish opportunity to do anything, nor does it establish apparent intention. So it's certainly a relevant consideration in the totality of the circumstances, but officers can't use force on someone just because they're on drugs. Now, I'd like to talk about, I'd like you to dis discuss the uh, severity of the crime at issue. How is that relevant to the, uh, the Graham analysis? Sure. So as we're thinking about the, the concept of threat, the Graham factors really help us identify when there's a threat and how much of a threat. Uh, severity of the crime can be best understood as a proxy for dangerousness. Yeah. All other things being equal, an armed bank robber may be suspected to be more dangerous than someone who is cashing a worthless check, for example. Um, so severity of the crime is really, uh, a, really a proxy for evaluating how much risk someone might present, how dangerous are they. And if we could go to the third factor then, the uh, uh, 
the, the act of resistance, whether they are actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight. How is that relevant to your analysis? Um, so again, this is all part of that threat analysis, that second step in my, in my framework. Uh, and this is getting at the behavior of the subject. So for example, someone who's attempting to evade arrest by flight is threatening the government's interest in apprehending that person. It's about identifying a threat of escape. Um, active resistance can be similar. It's a threat of someone frustrating the government's interest in taking them into custody, for example. Um, we talk, are there different types of resistance? Uh, yes, absolutely. What are the types generally accepted uh, definitions in policing as the different types of resistance? Sure. So the concepts are certainly generally accepted, although some of the vocabulary uh, differs from place to place. Um, we might first identify someone who is uh, compliant, who's doing what the officers want, no resistance at all, right? Uh, then we might have someone who is passive or non-compliant. They're not doing what the officers want, but they're not doing anything against what the officers are telling them to do either. Uh, the classic example of passive resistance is someone who's just laying on the ground, refusing to get up when told. Then there's active resistance, which is typically defined as someone who is engaging their muscles in some way. Someone who's tensing up or someone who's running away is engaged in active resistance. Next level up, if we can say that, is uh, active aggression. And this is where someone is not just engaging their muscles, they're engaging their muscles in a way that creates a threat of harm to the officers or someone else. And finally, the ultimate expression of active aggression is when a subject presents an imminent threat, again, as that term is defined, of death or serious bodily injury to officers or others. If we can take that down, please. Now, I think we've gone through uh, in a little more detail the first two steps of your four-step process. Uh, talk about identifying facts that would have been apparent to a reasonable officer. You've discussed uh, identifying threats. Uh, you also testify that you need to identify the foreseeable effects of the officer's actions. Can you explain what you mean by that? Absolutely. What I mean by the foreseeable effects of the officer's actions is essentially what is this use of force likely to do? Just as there is a spectrum of resistance from no resistance to a whole lot of resistance, right, threatening the life of an officer, there's also a spectrum of effects that we might expect from an officer's use of force. Uh, so, for example, some uses of force are relatively minor and unlikely to cause any more than temporary discomfort. Other uses of force are substantially likely to cause death or serious bodily injury, what we would refer to as deadly force. As you're analyzing use of force, it's very important to focus on the foreseeable effects of what the use of force uh, involved and not the actual effects, not what actually happened. And I can give you uh, an easy example. If an officer shoots at someone, that's a use of deadly force because it's foreseeable that discharging a firearm at someone is going to cause death or serious bodily injury. And that's true even if the officer misses entirely or if the bullet hits the person but causes a very superficial injury. Let's say it just scrapes them. It's still a use of deadly force because of the foreseeable effects, not the actual effects. And that concept of uh, foreseeable effect is what's foreseeable really at the time force is being used. And uh, Professor Soden, uh, the fourth uh factor that you testified about determining whether the officer's actions are appropriate, proportional, and reasonable. Can you please explain what you mean by appropriate, proportional, and reasonable? Yes, so what we're talking about is sort of a balancing of harms here. Uh, this also pulls from Graham v. Connor and the Fourth Amendment uh, standard, which talked about balancing the individual interest against the government interest. The idea is an officer cannot use more force than the situation justifies. That is, the foreseeable effects of the officer's use of force can't be disproportionate to the threat presented by the individual's actions. And sir, did you take all of these uh, factors into consideration in your performing your analysis in this case? Absolutely, yes. Uh, ask a, 
if you uh, assisted with the preparation of a demonstrative exhibit, demonstrative uh, 953. Yes, I did. And would the uh, use of that demonstrative exhibit assist you in explaining your analysis and testimony to the jury? Uh, yes, and especially how those factors apply. Okay. Um, offer exhibit uh, 953 for demonstrative purposes. Any objection? Right 953 is received for demonstrative purposes only. And before we uh, publish that, uh, first I'd like to publish what's been received as Exhibit 17 and ask you, sir, if you identified in accordance with your process what particular force you evaluated. So if you'd publish Exhibit 17. Yeah, so there are uh, two components to the use of force here. The first is the defendant's knee or shin over Mr. Floyd's neck. The second is uh, Mr. Floyd in that prone position while restrained, what I may refer to as prone restraint. Uh, at this time, I'd like to publish Exhibit 953. Uh, one moment, Your Honor. Did you also look at a demonstrative exhibit, exhibit uh, 949, that showed the relative position of, of the defendant and the other officers on Mr. Floyd? Yes, I did. All right. And again, here you can see uh, the, the two components of the use of force, the knee across Mr. Floyd's neck, as well as him being in the prone or face down position while restrained. I'm offering exhibit 949 for demonstrative purposes. Mm -hmm. For demonstrative purposes. 949 is received for demonstrative purposes only. Then using uh, what you saw as exhibit 17, which has been received substantively in 949, it, it, again, explain what particular force you are analyzing and over what period of time. Uh, yeah, so again, um, both the, the prior image, the photograph, and this, um, uh, this demonstrative uh, show the knee, uh, the defendant's knee across the back of Mr. Floyd's neck and Mr. Floyd face down in that prone position while handcuffed. The use of force here, use of force is not always a flash in the pan event. Firing a bullet might be, but other uses of force, including the uses of force in this case, are sustained. So they start when Mr. Floyd is put into the prone position and when the knee goes across the neck and the uses of force continue until the knee comes off the neck and Mr. Floyd is taken out of that prone position. And you indicated that the use of force included the defendant's placement of the knee on the neck. The other knee, uh, where did that appear to be placed? Uh, yes, variously on uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, upper arm, shoulder, or upper back. Okay. I would put that uh, for, for purposes I imagine we will discuss as part of um, holding Mr. Floyd in the prone position while restrained. What was uh, your determination of the duration of this uh, restraint period? From the time Mr. Floyd was originally placed, initially, excuse me, placed in the prone position nine minutes and approximately 29 seconds until the knee was taken off of his neck and he was taken out of that prone position. And did you determine this period of time based on uh, your review of uh, using uh, Officer King's body-worn camera footage starting at 2019-14 and ending at 20, 28, 43. Yes, that's correct. And is it your testimony that, uh, according to national standards, the use of force must be reasonable when it starts and it must be continue to be reasonable during the entire duration? Objection. Sustained. Rephrase. And, uh, sir, can you make any comment about how uh, long the particular use of force must be reasonable as in the defined uh, restraint period. Yeah, so a use of force that is sustained over a period of time does have to be reasonable at the time force is initiated. That is, that is when force is first used and throughout the duration that that force is being used. 
And I believe you testified that uh, you know, using and applying these national and constitutional standards is viewed through the eyes of a, what a reasonable police officer, a reasonable police officer at the scene. Is that correct? That's correct. That's part of the Graham v. Connor uh, framework, as well as certainly has been uh, adopted into generally accepted police practices. So then using your four-step analysis to identify relevant facts and circumstances that would have been apparent to a reasonable officer on the scene, would you please summarize for the jury based on your review what information would have been available to a reasonable police officer in the defendant's position prior to his arrival at the scene uh, that day? Yes, so the, the reasonable officer on the scene standard is an objective one. We don't just adopt an officer's idiosyncratic subjective perspective. Uh, we take the reasonable officer and put them into the actual officer's position and say, what would the reasonable officer have perceived, seen, heard, or believed? In this case, prior to the reasonable officer in the defendant's position arriving on scene, he would have been aware uh, that there was a call, I believe, dispatched about uh, counterfeiting, that the individual was described as possibly intoxicated, uh, the individual later identified as Mr. Floyd was uh, identified as possibly intoxicated, that um, two other officers had taken the call, um, had, um, I believe, taken someone into custody and called uh, Code 4, identified that they, they had the scene under control and did not need additional resources. Now what I'd like to do is uh, turning to the demonstrative 953. You can see the beginning of this uh, use of force evaluation, and you have this divided into different sections. Up top, you have threat factors. At the bottom, you have foreseeable effects of force. Uh, you have uh, the defendant and his conduct up top, um, activity of Mr. Floyd on the bottom. Is that right? Um, yes, the, the threat factors are really the uh, behaviors of Mr. Floyd and whether they presented any threat and the foreseeable effects of force are uh, really about the effects of the use of force on Mr. Floyd. Yes. Now, uh, what I'd like to do at this time is uh, show you uh, a first clip. This is taken from what has been received into evidence as Exhibit 45, uh, beginning at uh, timestamp 201740. And you see on the uh, demonstrative here, it says defendant arrives on the scene. Uh, I'd like to publish that clip first. Just the chair. You can't win, bro. You can't win. I'm not trying to win. Go on, get in the car. I'll be on the ground. Anything. Go get in the car. He know it. He know it, too, Mr. Officer. Y'all hear me? Don't do me like that, man. I'm in the car. Okay, I thought you were clean. So you get in this car. We can talk. I am a doc. I'm claustrophobic. I'm hearing you because you're not working with me. God, I'm claustrophobic. Get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the front. Please. No, you're not. I'm claustrophobic. Get in the car. Okay. I'm not a bad guy, man. Get in the car. I'm not a bad guy. Ah. You ain't gonna win. All right. Now, sir, this is taken from the perspective of the defendant's body-worn camera. Is that right? Yes, it is. What information would have been apparent to a reasonable officer based on the exchange we just observed? So a reasonable officer in the defendant's position would have realized that uh, Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs, uh, would have realized that there were two MPD officers already on scene, along with two more now, uh, the defendant and the officer uh, that he arrived with, um, would have realized that there was a, what we might call a point of conflict uh, between the officers and Mr. Floyd, who did not want to get into the back of the car. One of the things that that signifies is generally that, um, excuse me, um, generally that the individual has been searched. Uh, typically, an officer is not going to load someone into a squad into the back of a car until after they've been searched. Um, as I said, they're, they're a reasonable officer would have seen that this appears to be a point of conflict, would have heard that Mr. Floyd uh, was describing himself as claustrophobic, would have um, understood Mr. Floyd to be uh, 
offering some alternatives, right? Laying on the ground or sitting up in the front of the car as opposed to be putting, uh, being put in the back of the car. In other words, the point of contention does not appear to be police custody, right? Mr. Floyd does not appear to be objecting to being kept in police custody, but instead to be objecting to being put in the back of a vehicle. Now, you're aware that the uh, officers attempted to place him in the back of the vehicle and he was eventually um, taken back out of the back of the vehicle and into the street, is that right? Uh, yes, there was some non-compliance initially and then um, what we would describe as uh, that active resistance, what appears to be physical engagement of the muscles in a non-assaultive or non-aggressive way, uh, leading ultimately to the officer's decision to take him out of the rear passenger side of the vehicle. And so in your view, a reasonable officer would not have perceived this as active resistance, as an act of violence or active aggression, I should say. That's correct. This does not appear to be active aggression in the sense that um, Mr. Floyd does not appear to have the intention to assault or attack the officers here. His efforts um, appeared aimed at not being in the back seat of the car. Now I'd like to publish uh, the second clip, uh, clip two, which is taken from Exhibit 43, which is Officer King's body-worn camera. And the footage begins at uh, timestamp 20, 1901, and it's labeled Floyd placed prone. If you'd please publish that. What was it? Me, man. I can't fucking breathe. Here, come on out. Look at you, thank you. Thank you. Get up the ground. Ah. All right. So uh, we're paused here at mark uh, 201908. Is that right? Yes. Now, at this point, can you please uh, describe what would have been apparent to a reasonable officer at the scene? So, um, as you heard, Mr. Floyd uh, has already said, uh, I can't breathe. And as officers pull him out of the back seat of the car, again, that point of contention from earlier. Uh, you hear Mr. Floyd say, uh, thank you. And he is also uh, appears to be handcuffed, is that right? He is, he is handcuffed. And um, I believe, although not entirely clear from this freeze frame, I, I believe the, the video will show that he's on his knees at this point. If you'd resume playing clip, please. Yeah, on the ground, ah, on the ground. Ah, my ah. Ah. Right. You got your arm. Oh. Ah. 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 Restraint. Okay, Hobbled. Okay. Okay, okay, I'll grab that. Oh. Oh. Get All right. Now, from that segment that we just watched, clip two, can you please describe what information would have been available to a reasonable officer in the defendant's position at that time? Uh, Yes, so again, focusing on the threat analysis here in this, um, in this step, uh, Mr. Floyd remains handcuffed. He's put from his position on his knees where he's said, uh, thank you, and I appreciate that having been taken out of the back seat of the car. Uh, he's originally pushed over onto his left side, sort of facing the car, and then rolled from his left side into the prone position, into that face down position. Now, um, prior to uh, having him, I guess, first uh, brought down to the ground, uh, the, uh, at the time he was placed on his knees, I believe you indicated that he said, I appreciate that or thank you, something to that effect? Yes. All right. Uh, at that point, was it necessary for the officers to uh, prone him? No. Why yeah, not? Why not? Again, looking at the threat analysis here, um, it's clear from the number of officers and Mr. Floyd's position, the fact that he's handcuffed and has been searched, he doesn't present a threat of harm. His actions don't indicate that he presents any threat of escape. And as he's, uh, as he's saying thank you for being taken out of the backseat of the car, it would certainly suggest that the point of conflict that had provoked his resistance in the first place is, is over. It suggests a lack of intention. Um, given the Given the range of other alternatives available to the officers, it's just not appropriate to prone someone who is, at that point, cooperative. What is the purpose of placing someone in the prone position in accordance with generally accepted police standards? Yes, the, 
The prone position is a very useful position in policing for getting control of someone for purposes of handcuffing them. Uh, again, the prone position is just basically face down, right? Their chest, uh, front of the hips, uh, on the ground. When officers are struggling with someone or when they're handcuffing someone who they anticipate struggling with, you'll often see officers put someone into that prone position for purposes of handcuffing because it's very difficult for someone to uh, fight or to, revi to resist as they're face down on the ground, especially once their arms are out at their sides. However, the prone position, as useful as it is for handcuffing, is supposed to be transitory. It's used for handcuffing, and then as soon as someone has been handcuffed, you take them out of that position for, uh, I imagine, reasons that, that we'll discuss. Okay. And uh, the position that you take them out of and put them into, is that the side recovery position? It is, yes. If, if you could then, uh, I'm just recalling the clip we saw initially when uh, Mr. Floyd was on his knees and he was brought to the ground, what position was he in initially? So uh, initially, as he's, as he's on his knees, um, when he's brought over onto his left side, that would be consistent with the recovery position, laying on his side with his legs either straight or bent. And then from that, uh, essentially what would be the side recovery position, he was actually brought into the prone position from the, the recovery position, is that right? Yes, that's correct. It, uh, and, and at this point, or shortly after this point, the, uh, uh, the prone position, sorry, the prone restraint position begins, is that right? Uh, yes, when he is put into that prone position, uh, that's, that's where I would say that the prone restraint begins. He is restrained and prone. Now, uh, as well as the knee across the neck. These are really the two uses of force that I'm focusing on. All right, and this is where you've indicated as the beginning of the restraint period, is that right? That's correct, that red line indicates where the prone restraint and the knee across the neck begins in that timeline. Now, uh, I need to ask you, at the time that he was placed prone, when this use of force uh, uh, was done, was Mr. Floyd uh, a threat? So again, threat is um, specific, but I, no, I, I don't see him presenting a threat of anything. Um, he was not a threat of harm to the officers. Um, even to the extent he had physical ability, he didn't have much in the way of opportunity to assault or harm the officers. And just as importantly, there's no specific and articulable facts that an officer, a reasonable officer in the defendant's because position could use to conclude that he had the intention of causing physical harm to the officers or others. It's very clear um, that although he had legs, so I suppose he had the physical ability to run away, he does not have the opportunity to do so. And again, there's no facts from which we could assess any intention to escape, so no threat of escape. And really, in light of the situation, there's not even a credible threat of uh, obstructing the investigation with four officers in the immediate area and one more, I believe a park police officer, maybe half a block away uh, across the street, um, there are ample resources on scene to maintain control and custody of Mr. Floyd. Two officers can stand with him and the other two can go about doing the uh, what was ultimately a forgery investigation. And if we could go to the next clip, please. Right, and uh, that clip is taken from what's been received as Exhibit 49, uh, which is the uh, body-worn camera of Officer Tao. Is that right? Yes, it is. And it starts at 202131. If we could publish that, please. Uh, um, I please, please let me stay in. No, please, man, I can't breathe. Can you please uh, explain to the jury what you heard and saw in this clip that's relevant to your analysis? Uh, yes, yeah, so there are, there are a couple of things. First, of course, you hear Mr. Floyd saying that he can't breathe. Uh, that will uh, come up as we talk about the foreseeable effects uh, of, the, of the use of force. You also hear the officers discussing and ultimately concluding uh, that they aren't going to use the, the hobble restraint.
Did they discuss why they wouldn't use the hobble restraint? Um, you hear, uh, yes, you hear one of the officers say because uh, something, something like if we use the hobble, a, a sergeant's going to have to come. Now, uh, can you please uh, tell the jury what the, you know, generally how a hobble restraint system works and what it's for? Yes, a hobble, um, a hobble is used to limit the motion of someone's legs. So if they're kicking or flailing around with the legs, uh, especially someone who's in, for example, the back seat of a police car who may be kicking out the windows or something like that. And essentially the hobble uh, goes around the ankles and binds the ankles together and then is connected to uh, a belt piece, um, sort of a, a component around the midsection to slightly bend the individual's legs. Um, Historically, uh, the, the legs used to be bent up behind someone. Think of laying on your stomach and then kicking your, your feet up, uh, up towards your butt. Uh, the way hobbles are generally used now is the feet aren't behind the individual, they're just brought up. So the knees are kept in front of the body and brought up a little bit. Again, the point is just to make it um, much more difficult, if not impossible, for the individual to kick. And what would a reasonable police officer on the scene use to determine whether a hobble restraint is appropriate? So hobbles are generally appropriate when officers cannot effectively restrain someone using only handcuffs. When they have someone who is continuing to kick or flail or flop around uncontrollably. Uh, is the absence or presence or the need to, to summon a supervisor an appropriate reason to either use or not use a hobble? No, if the situation justifies a hobble, then um, officers should use the hobble, regardless of the fact that that means a supervisor will have to respond. If the situation does not justify a hobble, then they shouldn't use a hobble, regardless of the requirement to um, summon a supervisor. And would you agree that a hobble is just sort of a brand name for a form of MRT or maximal restraint technique? Uh, yeah, so hobble, uh, four-point restraint, maximal restraint, um, there are specific brands like the rip hobble, uh, but yeah, these, these are all essentially the same concept that we're talking about. And uh, was the application of force by the officers without the hobble essentially a maximal restraint technique, but without the use of that tool? To the extent that the hobble would effectively immobilize someone and keep them from kicking, then what you see here is officers controlling Mr. Floyd's upper body, middle body, and lower body, which would keep him from kicking. So although not a perfect parallel, I would certainly describe it as a behavioral analog of the, a maximal restraint or, or a hobble-like technique. And when uh, an individual is placed in the maximal restraint, uh, the hobble, are they supposed to be placed in the side recovery position? Absolutely. Just like handcuffing, as soon as an individual is restrained, handcuffs or hobble, get the person off of their stomach, out of the prone restraint and into a side recovery position. And I'd like to then uh, move to the next uh, segment. If, if I may, on... on oh. Let's... Let, we, we can move to the next segment here. Uh, we're looking at the next clip, which is... Uh, exhibit 47 beginning uh, at 202347 if you would publish that please roll on the side all right can you please uh, and you can move forward then in the next Expl please explain to the jury uh, what you heard that was relevant to your analysis uh, in that exchange. So there's one officer who's suggesting or asking uh, about whether they should roll Mr. Floyd onto his side, and you hear the, um, the, uh, the defendant uh, say, no, he's, he's staying put, and they're going to keep him in the prone restraint. Okay, and what was the significance of that? It would indicate to a reasonable officer that at least one person there did not feel that Mr. Floyd presented the level of threat that required them to keep him in that prone restraint position, that at least one person was suggesting we can flip him onto his side or should we flip him onto his side. Okay. And if you could proceed to the next clip. 
And again, uh, if you could play that segment, Exhibit 47 at 20, 25, 38. And move forward. And again, we heard a similar exchange. Is that right? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, along with um, one of the bystanders in the in the background saying he's he's not responsive right now. Both of those are factors to consider in identifying the threat that Mr. Floyd presented. If he's not responsive, obviously he can't present any threat. And the fact that you have an officer suggesting roll him onto his side again suggests the perception that officers are fully capable of maintaining custody and control of Mr. Floyd without keeping him in that prone restraint position. Now, in accordance with your four-step process, the next step is to identify foreseeable effects of the officer's actions. Is that right? Yes, that's it, correct. You did that in this case. Is that right? Yes. Um, and I'd like you to uh, please discuss, uh, if you could advance the slide here. Go ahead. Uh, we have some uh, potential foreseeable effects. What does a reasonable officer have to take into account when determining what the uh, uh, potential foreseeable effects of their actions are? Sure. So under that first step of the analysis, we look at the facts and circumstances as they would have been aware to a reasonable uh, officer on the scene. And some of those facts and circumstances may um, indicate that there are specific foreseeable effects of force. So in this case, again, we have those two separate uh, uh, components of force that I'm going to address. One is the knee across the neck. That foreseeably can cause pretty significant serious bodily injury or death. Uh, if you think uh, of someone who's laying face down, where the head or face is against the ground and the chest is against the ground, that means the neck is kind of like a suspension bridge, right? So it's generally accepted in policing that you do not put weight down on someone's neck in that position because of the potential that the neck won't be able to handle that weight and you can end up damaging the structures of the neck. That's kind of generic, there's nothing specific that we need uh, in this case. That applies to, to all defendants. So um, I'm, uh, I apologize, all individuals. Um, there are also foreseeable effects of keeping someone in that prone position. Uh, prominently, what's called positional asphyxia, someone who starts having trouble breathing, who can't take in over time the amount of oxygen that they need to sustain their life functions. Um, this is something that's been very well known in policing for at least going on 30 years. The prone restraint position limits the ability of someone to breathe. And there are some additional specific factors uh, relevant to this case that increase the susceptibility of Mr. Floyd to positional asphyxia and that a reasonable officer would have known prior to the use of force. Um, specifically, Ask another question. And, and those uh, additional risk factors, would those include the downward pressure of the weight of... Overruled. Weight of the officers. Uh, yes, absolutely. Additional weight on a subject's back can further compromise their breathing, rendering them more susceptible to positional asphyxia. The... Yep. There's no Apologies, All right, at this time, uh, I'm going to ask that the next clip, clip six, which is taken from exhibit uh, 49, which is, uh, I believe, Tao's body-worn camera, and it starts at uh, a timestamp 20, 21, 50. If you would play that, please. Uh, uh, what, do you, what do you want? I can breathe. Please, the knee in my neck. I can breathe shit. Uh -huh. Well, get up, get in the car, man. I will. Get up, get in the car. I can't move. I've been wiping the whole ah 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 ah
Are we looking at a break? Were, were you signaling to me, Judge, that we... No, you tell me in the next 10 minutes when a good break is. Oh, okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, with respect to this uh, portion that we just viewed, uh, what uh, did you see that was relevant to your analysis with respect to potential foreseeable consequences of the officer's actions? So two things really stand out. Uh, one is you hear Mr. Floyd uh, saying that he can't breathe. And one of the indicators of susceptibility to positional asphyxia is that someone starts having difficulty breathing. Um, the, uh, other, the other component, one of the, one of the factors that can increase the susceptibility to positional asphyxia is drug or alcohol intoxication. Uh, even before the defendant arrived on scene, the, uh, the, the counterfeiting uh, suspect, who was later identified as Mr. Floyd, um, was described as possibly intoxicated. And here in this clip, you can hear the officers discussing the likelihood that he's intoxicated, that he was found uh, with drug paraphernalia on him and that they suspect there might be uh, other drugs in play. And there are other things that an officer can listen to, even uh, including a report of distress from the, from the person themselves. Is that right? The person upon whom force is being applied. Absolutely. If someone is um, describing that they are experiencing medical distress, then officers have to take that into account as they're evaluating the continued effects of keeping someone in, in this case, a prone restraint position. I'd like to play clip seven, which is taken from Exhibit 43, King's Body Worn Camera at 2022-18. We publish. I'm through. I'm through. I'm claustrophobic. My stomach hurts. Uh -huh. My neck hurts. Uh -huh. Everything hurts. Ah, there's the water or something. Please. Please. Ah, I can't breathe. Hey, ah. Stop talking. Stop yelling. They will kill me. They will kill me, man. Ah. Takes a heck of a lot of oxygen, though. Yeah. Come on, man. Now, during uh, what we just uh, viewed as clip seven, was the uh, the defendant was the use of force the same as uh, it, you know when you began analyzing this at point zero? Um. Um, Yes, he, the officers are maintaining Mr. Floyd in that prone restraint position, but there are some additional indicators that the foreseeable effects of force are, uh, are occurring, that he's experiencing uh, positional asphyxia. Uh, and did you hear uh, Mr. Floyd you know, say uh, plainly that he was experiencing some form of medical distress? Not only does he indicate it with the words he's using, saying that he can't breathe, but even compared to that prior clip, his voice is slower and thicker. So both what he is saying and how he is saying it would indicate an increased, uh, increased medical distress. And would a reasonable officer on the scene then, hearing this, have at least been aware of the complaint? Uh, absolutely, uh, especially uh, when, when you hear an officer respond to that complaint, uh, certainly an indication that an officer was aware of it. Okay. And uh, you reviewed uh, uh, these body-worn cameras on numerous occasions, is that right? Yes, many times. And did you have an opportunity to review body-worn camera uh, in which the defendant's uh, voice could be heard at the same time that you could see him as the speaker? Um, I believe there is, uh, it, yes, his, it, it's, he is identifiable as the speaker. I forget which body-worn camera that, that is, or could, maybe it's the comparison of multiple body-worn cameras, but he is identifiable as the speaker there. And I'm sorry, and in the exchange we just heard, was he identifiable as the speaker who was saying, uh-huh? Yes. If we could go to clip eight, just taken from exhibit 47, yeah, 20, 24, 40. Can you please uh, explain to the jury what you heard and saw in that clip that's relevant to your analysis as to the foreseeable effects of force? 
So the first thing you hear is one of the bystanders say he's passed out or something like that, and that's echoed by um, one of the officers who says he's passing out. As we're assessing, um, first, as we're assessing threat, if we can jump back to that for a second, someone who's passing out obviously does not present a threat. Um, you don't hear Mr. Floyd, which is notable because until he stopped speaking, uh, his vocalizations were kind of incessant, right? There, there weren't very many periods where he wasn't speaking until until he wasn't. Um, and you hear the, the I, I'm sorry, back to the, the officer, you hear an officer saying uh, he's passing out. Um, that again indicates an increasing level now of medical distress. And the officer who was stating this was in close proximity to the defendant at the time he was saying it, is that right? Uh, he was. I believe this is Officer Lane who is at Mr. Floyd's feet. So um, maybe of the of the officers who are on Mr. Floyd, maybe in the worst position to identify exactly what Mr. Floyd is going through, but still identifying that he's passing out. In the clip that we just viewed at 2024-40, that was approximately 40 seconds after a time that you've identified that uh, Mr. Floyd had said, I can't breathe approximately 27 times. Is that the incessant speech you were talking about? Yes, um, before he fell silent, Mr. Floyd uh, said, I can't breathe by my count at least 27 times. Okay. Now, if we can uh, advance to the next clip. Um, and I guess before we publish uh, the, the next clip, which was from Exhibit 43 at 2025-40, uh, you made a notation here on the uh, demonstrative exhibit regarding Mr. Floyd's movement and uh, in his speech, is that right? Yes, that's correct. So from um, uh, approximately four minutes and 45 seconds after the prone restraint had begun for the next 53 seconds, Mr. Floyd is silent. He's not saying anything, but he's still uh, moving slightly. And would this have been readily apparent to a reasonable officer in the defendant's, at the defendant's vantage point at that particular moment? Uh, absolutely. And if we could publish uh, the, the next clip. Right now. He's not responsive right now, bro. No, bro, look at him. He's not responsive right now, bro. Bro, are you serious? He's not with that on his neck, Is he breathing right now? Check his pulse. Check his pulse. Check his And what did you see in that clip that was relevant to your uh, foreseeable effective force analysis? So here the audio starts with the bystanders um, saying that, he, that Mr. Floyd is not responsive, um, pleading with officers to check his pulse. Uh, Officer King does so, spends uh, six or seven seconds checking, um, looks like two locations or maybe trying to get a pulse on, on the same location twice before ultimately announcing that he can't find a pulse. Uh, at that point, the defendant says, huh, and um, Officer King clarifies and says, I, I was trying to find a pulse or, or something like that. Jumping up to the threat factors then, uh, as we're looking at the same event, is Mr. Floyd presenting anybody a threat at this point? No, someone who does not have a pulse does not present a threat in any way. Now I'd like to advance to clip 11. Okay. All right, if you would publish that, please. Please uh, tell the jury what you saw relevant to your analysis with respect to foreseeable effects. So you hear Officer Lane describe Mr. Floyd as not responsive. Uh, this is as the paramedics are arriving and uh, Officer Lane is, is directing them uh, by, by saying that uh, Mr. Floyd is not responsive. Um, again, back up to the threat factor, certainly uh, cannot be a threat if he's not responsive. and now even more uh, indication that the use of force is having deleterious effects on Mr. Floyd's health. Okay. And uh, if we can advance to the next clip, right? 
at a point, and, and I don't believe that's a, oh yes, actually go ahead and publish that. Uh, it's the Fraser video, 202852, Exhibit 15. What is it you see here that was relevant to your analysis? This is um, immediately before Mr. Floyd is loaded onto the stretcher, uh, and you see the defendant take his knee off of Mr. Floyd uh, and shortly after that, that particular clip, Mr. Floyd is, is rolled and lifted onto the structure. And so would that then mark the end of the restraint period at 9 minutes and 29 seconds? Yes, it would. Right. Your Honor, this would be an opportune time for a break. Right, jury, let's take our 20-minute break.
to remind you, you're still under oath. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, sir, during this uh, restraint period that you've defined from, you know, second zero to 929, did uh, George Floyd present a threat of escape during this encounter? No, he did not. Did he present a threat to physical property? No, he did not. Uh, did he present a threat to the physical safety of the officers? No, he did not. Or anyone else? No. Did he present any sort of threat at all? No. Your analysis, uh, you noticed that uh, there were a number of bystanders in the area, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Did your analysis include an assessment of what impact bystanders may have had on the situation? Yes, so now moving into the, the, the fourth step of my analytical framework, um, the uh, facts and circumstances include the bystanders and their interactions. All right. And at this time, I'd like to play uh, clip 12, which is exhibit 49, starting at marker uh, uh, timestamp 2022-22. Is water or something? Please, please. Ah, uh, I can't breathe. Ah, they will kill me. Okay. They will kill me, man. Ah, ah. Your feet on the bed, man. You get off the bed, man. How many uh, bystanders did you observe at that particular moment in time? Um. A handful. There are um, five visible on the screen. At one point, it looks like someone a little a little further to the left of the screen is maybe walking across the street. And this is another example of a clip that we've previously seen. Is that right? The, it, just taken from the body worn camera of Officer Tao, who had a um, was oriented toward the bystanders. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so the video clip that's uh, sort of directly below the 2022-18 clip. Um, we heard uh, Mr. Floyd saying the same things. That was when I was uh, describing his voice getting slower and thicker. In, in the end of that clip and at the near the end of, of this clip that we just watched, uh, watched, excuse me, you can hear one of the bystanders make um, a, a statement about uh, the officers being on Mr. Floyd's neck. That is the first time in this interaction uh, more than three and a half minutes since the use of force began that any bystanders are criticizing what the officers are doing. The only prior comments from one of the bystanders are uh, encouraging Mr. Floyd, uh, Mr. Floyd to comply with the officers. Right. And uh, so at, prior to this point, just describing the noise level or the, the volume of the bystanders and their voices at the time that uh, George Floyd is expressing some medical distress to the defendant. Um, as you can hear, the bystanders are, are pretty quiet. You hear uh, Mr. McMillan's, I, I believe it is, voice um, near, near the end of the clip. But other than that, it doesn't sound like anything more than normal road traffic. If you could please then advance to clip 13. And this is uh, from exhibit 15, which is the Frazier Bystander video at 2023-11. If you would publish that, please. This is why you don't do drugs, kids. I can't breathe. What did you hear in that clip that was relevant to your analysis of other facts and circumstances as related to the bystanders? So you hear Officer Tao say something like, this is why you don't do drugs, kids, uh, to the crowd. Um, you can see when he makes that comment, he's standing sort of uh, parallel or, or maybe next to the officers. Um, that's relevant because if you are concerned about a crowd, if you are worried about interference from bystanders, you don't say things that are likely to exacerbate that situation with the crowd. And a comment like, this is why you don't do drugs, kids, is not report building. It is... Uh, uh, excuse me. 
I'm going to sustain as cumulative. Uh, at some point, did the uh, noise level of the crowd increase? Uh, yes, it did later later in the incident. And, and at this point, I'd like to uh, play clip 14, which is from Exhibit 15 at 202903. You can see, uh, before we play it from the timeline, this occurs after um, the ambulance had arrived and the restraint period was over. Is that right? That's correct. At this point, the use of force was concluded, and um, Mr. Floyd was, I believe, on the on the gurney or being loaded into it. All right. If you would publish that last clip, please. Don't touch me. Do not touch me again. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I've been here the whole time. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. take that down and again that happened after the restraint period was over is that right and the paramedics had arrived yes it did and um, as we discussed um, as you're evaluating use of force you look at the facts and circumstances as they existed at the time which means you can't consider events that occurred later after the use of force is concluded to justify earlier use of force in your analysis, did the uh, bystanders present a threat during the restraint period? Uh, no, they did not present a threat to the officers. Okay. And uh, it, it's judged by a reasonable officer on the scene in the defendant's position. Would a reasonable officer have perceived them as a threat? No, the facts and circumstances suggest um, not. Um, for example, Officer Tao did not interpose himself between the bystanders and the other officers until more than six minutes into the prone restraint period. Um, his communications with the crowd were, uh, as discussed, um, when individual bystanders stepped into the street and were directed back up onto the curb, uh, with one exception, they did so within a few seconds without any type of uh, physical contact. When there was physical contact between Officer Tao and one of the bystanders who looked like a, an older child or a young boy, um, that bystander was uh, swiftly grabbed and pulled away by another one of the bystanders. Now, uh, did you see the defendant interact uh, in or, you know, with or in the area of any of the bystanders after the restraint period was over? Um, after the restraint period was over, uh, yes, the defendant um, left the position where he had been during the restraint and walked back, uh, I believe, to his squad, the police vehicle, uh, walking by several of the bystanders, not really interacting with them, but just walking by them or, or near them. And then once in uh, his vehicle, uh, he interacted with, uh, I believe, the, the same bystander we had discussed earlier, um, Charlie McMillan. Right. Charles McMillan, apologies. And do you recall uh in reviewing this matter, uh, reviewing a statement that the defendant made to Charles McMillan explaining his use of force uh, upon Mr. Floyd to Mr. McMillan. Yes, I do. Do you recall what the defendant's explanation for his uh, force level was? So the, this, of course, will not be an exact quotation, but it was something akin to um, describing Mr. Floyd as a, a pretty big guy, um, possibly uh, under the influence or on drugs, and that officers needed to keep control of, over him. Okay. And what is your assessment of this explanation? Does it, does it justify the level of force based on the defendant's explanation to Mr. McMillan that was used on Mr. Floyd that day? All of those individual statements are true. Uh, Mr. Floyd was a large individual, and um, there was, uh, as we've discussed, ample reason to suggest uh, to a reasonable officer that he may be impaired by alcohol or drugs. Um, but no, officers in this situation, and a reasonable officer would have perceived in this situation, that they could maintain control of him without putting a knee on his neck or keeping him in that prone position. <clears throat> Is there a, a, a national uh, recognized standard for police officers with respect to the duty to render aid and preserve life? Yes, it has um, long and, and rather loudly been said that the sanctity of human life is the highest priority in policing. That's absolutely generally accepted in policing. And what does that include? What does that mean in practice? 
Uh, it has a couple of different implications, uh, one of which regard to the, the use of force itself, the second of which is the um, duty to assist or render aid to the extent that the officer has the ability and equipment to do so when individuals are in medical distress. What if the officer doesn't believe the person who's reporting to be in medical distress? Officers are not paramedics, they're not EMTs, they're not medical diagnosticians, they're not doctors. The person um, may be lying, but officers have a duty to respond to the situation as it appears. They cannot take for granted, just because some people lie to the police about medical distress, that everyone they are interacting with or that any one in particular person they are interacting with is lying about being in medical distress. You have to take that seriously. And uh, what facts and circumstances does a reasonable officer take into account when determining whether or not they should render medical aid? Um, a whole range of factors, uh, what someone is saying, how they are saying it, um, observations by uh, other people. In this case, in the clips, you hear bystanders identifying that Mr. Floyd is uh, not responsive, for example, or um, may not be breathing. Um, so whether uh, the reasonable officer is really paying close attention to Mr. Floyd or whether the reasonable officer is really paying closer attention to the crowd, the point is the same. The evidence is suggesting that there is medical distress here. Of course, you also look at the individual's behavior. So in this case, you can uh, not only hear Mr. Floyd saying that he can't breathe, but you hear the change in his voice, as we discussed. You... Uh, hear him stop talking, you see him stop moving, and the reasonable officer here uh, would have been aware that at one point he no longer had a pulse. All of those individually are indicators of medical distress, and as you look at them comprehensively in order, it's signs of increasing medical distress. Then, uh, Professor, I'd like to go to the last uh, stage of your four-part analysis, and that is to determine whether officers' actions are appropriate proportional and reasonable. Uh, and I'd like you to now please share the with the jury what conclusions that you have uh, reached regarding the use of force by the defendant on Mr. Floyd. So i ask you first, you have an opinion to a degree, a reasonable degree of professional certainty as to whether the type of force used by the defendant on George Floyd on May 25, 2020 constituted deadly force. I do, yes. And what is that opinion? that it did. The use of force f had the foreseeable effect and a substantial likelihood of resulting in death or great bodily harm. Do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of professional certainty as to whether the type of force used by the defendant on George Floyd on May 25, 2020 was reasonable as viewed by a reasonable police officer on the scene? I do have such an opinion, yes. What is that opinion? Both the knee across Mr. Floyd's neck and the prone restraint were unreasonable, excessive, and contrary to generally accepted police practices. When, in your opinion, did the unreasonable force begin? When Mr. Floyd was initially put into the prone restraint position and when the defendant's knee uh, was placed onto his neck. And when did it end? When the defendant's knee was lifted off of Mr. Floyd and he was taken out of the prone restraint position. Do you have an opinion to a degree of reasonable professional certainty as to whether defendant's use of force whereby he restrained Mr. Floyd in that prone position for 9 minutes and 29 seconds on May 25, 2020 was reasonable as viewed by a reasonable police officer on the scene? Yes. And what is that opinion? No reasonable officer would have believed that that was an appropriate, acceptable, or reasonable use of force. And was the force, uh, did the force, uh, was the force unreasonable as it started and as it ended? From the time it was initiated and throughout its duration, yes. And finally, do you have a degree, I'm sorry, an opinion to a degree of reasonable professional certainty as to whether the defendant appropriately uh, rendered medical aid to Mr. George Floyd on May 25, 2020 in accordance with generally accepted police practices? I do, yes. And what is that opinion? The failure to render aid to Mr. Floyd, both by taking him out of the prone position and by rendering aid as his increasing medical distress became obvious, was unreasonable and contrary to generally accepted police practices. 
Right. Thank you very much, Professor Stoughton. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson. Just a moment, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Stoughton. Stoughton, correct? Stoughton, yes. But okay. Nobody gets it right, so I won't take it personally. All right. So, Mr. Stoughton, uh, you testified that you've been a you were a police officer for approximately five years before going into uh, the more academic uh, nature of your work. Uh, I was full time with the police department for a little less than five years and stayed on as a reservist for another six months um, and was an investigator before ultimately going to law school and taking an academic route. Yes. Okay. And you. Uh, analyze this case principally from an academic standpoint, correct? I would not describe it as academic. No, I would describe it as the professional standards for policing. Okay. And the Graham versus Connor standard that you've discussed, I mean, there's more to it than just those three factors. Agreed? The Graham v. Connor standard is the, the Fourth Amendment standard, yes. There's um, more to Graham v. Connor and there's more to the professional standard than just Graham v. Connor. And that would include um, that the analysis of an officer's use of force is viewed from the totality of the circumstances, correct? As viewed through the lens of a reasonable officer, yes. So it's not just 14 10 second clips, it's the totality of the circumstances viewed through that lens. Agreed? Yes. And in fact, one of the standards that Graham versus Connor, or Connor establishes is that. Um, shouldn't be viewed from the 2020 lens of hindsight, right? The 2020 lens of hindsight is an admonition to not rely on evidence that was not available to officers at the time. It's part of the reasonable officer on the scene standard. It of course doesn't mean that we can't evaluate an officer's use of force after the fact. Understood. But the information, what we look at is the information that was available to the officer on scene at the time based on the reasonable officer standard, right? Uh, not exactly. It's the information that was available to a reasonable officer at the time, not a subjective, the information that the individual officer had. Understood. So we look at it from a broader lens than just the officer that was actually on scene, agreed? Uh, an objective lens, yes. Right. And that includes um, all of the things that would be known to a reasonable police officer on the scene? Yes. All right. So you, you started, uh, you described your kind of four-prong approach to the analysis of uh, this particular case. Uh, same approach you take in every review you've done, correct? Yes. And ultimately, um, ultimately, you focused the majority of, as, as I understood, the majority of your testimony, your direct testimony, on the third and fourth prongs of that analysis. Would you agree with that? Um, no, I, I would describe most of my testimony as being about the second and third prongs, the whether uh, Mr. Floyd presented any threat, and if so, how much, and uh, the risk factors to Mr. Floyd, the foreseeable effects of force. Okay. I apologize. This, you're right, the second and third. The fourth being uh, the generally accepted police practices, right? Yes. All right. Um, so let's start kind of from the beginning. One of the things that a reasonable police officer is entitled to do is rely on his or her training. Agreed? Um, in part, uh, an officer is not entitled under that professional standard to rely on training that's unreasonable. So uh, the training has to be consistent with generally accepted police practices. But if the training is based upon generally accepted police practices, an officer is an, a reasonable officer is entitled to rely on his or her training. Agreed? Uh, I I'm not entirely sure what you mean by in, entitled to. I'm analyzing whether an officer's actions are consistent with those generally accepted police practices. So if the training is consistent and the officer's behavior is consistent, then yes, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what you mean by entitled. When an officer approaches any use of force or any arrest, one of the things that a reasonable police officer 
takes into consideration is his or her training. And provided that that training is based upon generally accepted police practices, they can rely on their training in assessing the risk, the threat, all of the things that you've discussed. Agreed? I, I, think, there, I think you're asking two different questions. So one question is, what does an officer rely on? And the second is, how does that factor into the analysis of an officer's actions? And those are very different questions. Okay. So let's answer them one by one. Sure. Starting with the first. How would you answer the first? Um, yes, officers generally rely on their training. At least I certainly hope that's the case. And that also factors into the, the analysis, correct? No. I'm not assessing an officer and whether they satisfied their training standards. I'm looking at whether they satisfied generally accepted police practices. So for my purposes, it's irrelevant whether an officer is doing what they were trained to do or what they were not trained to do because I'm looking at the professional norms that we expect. Fair enough. Okay. Now, when an officer, let's kind of look at those second and third prongs step, step by step a little bit again. Um, you testified that when an officer, a reasonable officer, is allowed to uh, take into consideration what information they would have, it, have received before the use of force began. Agreed? Uh, yes. And in this particular case, you understand that Officer Chauvin was initially dispatched to this offense, correct? Yes. That that dispatch was subsequently canceled, correct? Yes. That a second set of officers responded or took over the call, so to speak, correct? Yes. yes and that Officer Chauvin, without the other officers on scene, was dispatched in an emergent state. Agreed? I explained the last part, I'm sorry. The officers on the scene did not request backup. A dispatcher made the determination that these officers needed assistance, correct? Um, I, well, offhand, I don't remember exactly the justification for the response, but I, I will accept that if that's your representation. And ultimately, so if, if an officer is canceled from a call, but then in an emergent situation, that's going to give a reasonable police officer a heightened a sense of awareness as they respond to that call. Agreed? Um, it depends on what information is provided to the officer and the reason they're responding, whether they're responding uh, code three, lights and sirens, or, or not. Um, I would say it, it can, but I'm not aware of any facts and circumstances that would apply in this case. So in this particular case, after officers King and Lane initially responded to the, to the call, dispatch um, uh, sent Officer Chauvin and Officer Tao code three to the scene. Do you don't recall that? Um, I, I would have to review the materials, but again, I'll, I'll accept your representation of that. And ultimately it was then because they were taking somebody out of the car, correct? Implying that a reasonable officer would know that someone was being removed from the car for some reason, right? Yes, yes, and I recall that now, thank you. And an officer would have that, a reasonable officer, if we can take what they would know before the use of force into consideration, would know that fact. Yes, a reasonable officer would have known that at some point prior officers removed Mr. Floyd from the vehicle, and or one from a vehicle. One of, the, one of the factors that you discussed uh, in terms of the Graham v. Connor standard was the severity of the crime they were responding to, right? Yes. And ultimately, in terms of that, is it, do reasonable police officers frequently encounter a situation that starts out as a mild offense, but uh, elevates to something more serious? Um, it's certainly possible. I don't think there's any reason to suggest that there, there were facts or circumstances of that, of that here. Well, if the officers who were initially on scene were struggling with an individual, resulting in dispatch stepping up two additional officers code three, that would Im at least imply that there was something more serious than just a counterfeiting, correct? Uh, no, not necessarily. In, in this case, they were taking Mr. Floyd out of the vehicle for the counterfeiting resulting in a dispatcher stepping up the call to code three? Yes. And so, in again, reasonable police officers, in addition to relying on their training, provided it meets professional standards, they also can rely on their experience as right. 
Uh, with the same caveats, yes. The, the, Provided yes. that those prior experiences meet with professional standards. Right. Uh, again, there's a difference between what an officer is relying on and whether their behavior meets the generally accepted police practices. And um, so one of those types of issues that a police officer may have experienced is uh, perhaps people don't like to be arrested, right? Uh, that is not uncommon. Right. And that people uh, who are being arrested sometimes feign illness or feign uh, some medical emergency in order to avoid being arrested. Agreed? Um, so officers would know that when they get someone medical attention and it turns out that a qualified medical provider can say there's nothing here. Or that uh, the person's you know, behaviors change, right? They say, I, I have, I'm having a heart attack, but then their behaviors are inconsistent with their words. They start doing jumping jacks or something. I've never seen that. Okay. So it's also, again, based on an officer's experience. Uh, it would be reasonable, reasonable police officers may experience uh, one suspect in a car disrupting the police uh, intervention to assist other people in the car from avoiding apprehension. Have you seen that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can you ask that again? Sure. There would be, again, based on a reasonable police officer standards, or a reasonable police officer's experience, excuse me, that one person who is being detained by police may obstruct that police uh, intervention to sort of protect or hide information about his or her passengers. That the individual who is being detained may... I, Resist or obstruct in order to prevent his or her friends from being searched or identified? Um, I, I suppose, at least in, in theory, that's possible. In this case, it's not clear that a reasonable officer in the defendant's position would have been aware that there were passengers. Well, did you, you, you said you spent 120 to 130 hours reviewing the body cameras, correct? Yeah, something like that. And you are aware where Officer Chauvin... And the rest of the materials, of course. And you're aware of where Officer Chauvin and Officer, uh, late, or excuse me, Officer Tao parked their vehicle, right? Yes. And you were aware, based on the materials, that an additional squad car uh, was there from the Minneapolis Park Police, correct? Yes. And that that officer, where they were parked, was essentially across the street from each other at the point that Officer Chauvin arrived. Agreed? Yes, there were there were several cars on that street. I'm, what I'm saying is I, I'm not sure what a reasonable officer in Officer Chauvin's position would have known about events that occurred on scene prior to his arrival. He would know that other officers also responded, correct? Yes. And he, based on the dispatch, we know that Squad 830 from the Minneapolis Park Police arrived. Yes. Right? And when he arrived, he would be able to look across the street see that park police officer engaged with and doing whatever he's doing, presumably. Um, presumably, if he, yes, if he looked across the street and saw that, I, I don't know what the officer was doing at the time or what. An officer has to be attuned to his or her circumstances and surroundings, agreed? Yes. A reasonable police officer has to have a particular situational awareness, right? Yeah. I. I Yes, I wouldn't say a particular one. I would say a general situational awareness, absolutely. Right, and so when Officer Chauvin arrived, if he parked directly across the street from another squad car and was aware based on dispatch that another squad car was in fact present, a reasonable officer would be generally aware of what all officers are doing, right? No, uh, the, they're, a reasonable officer who arrives without more specific information would not know whether that park police officer is talking to other witnesses about the counterfeiting call or other suspects or uh, passengers in the vehicle that Mr. Floyd was taken out of. Um, the, just seeing an officer interact with someone does not provide nearly enough context to understand, well, the, the context of that interaction. And so um, a reasonable officer would never take into consideration that that other officer even if it were another citizen, in terms of, again, the use of force, 
that other officer becomes unavailable to assist him based on what he or she is doing. Objection vague and compound. Overruled. The officer would, n I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can sure. you ask that again, please? A reasonable police officer arrives on scene, right? He looks to his left and he sees a, an officer talking to two citizens. Looks to his right and he sees two officers struggling with a, an individual or having a point of contention, I believe you called it, with an individual, right? At the point where he arrived, I wouldn't call them struggling, but yes. Right. But he observes that there's obviously something that's a little bit more serious going on here, right? Um, I, yes, at least they have one individual in custody there or in handcuffs, yes. Right. And the reasonable police officer would know that that other officer who's all the way across the street is not going to be as much of an assistance as he could potentially be as he's approaching the... I, yes, I th I, I, if I understand your question, uh, yes, as the, as the officer uh, arrives there, he is in a better position to offer immediate assistance to the officers interacting with the handcuffed individual than an officer who is talking to whomever. And a reasonable police officer will assess a person's words in the context of their actions, agreed? I would say assess both their words and their actions, yes. And if someone is saying, I'm going to cooperate, I'm going to cooperate, I'm going to cooperate, that's what they're saying, their words are saying, but their actions are not cooperative, right? What is an officer to do in that situation? Just automatically believe that they're going to sometime cooperate? I think it depends on the situation. Um, no, I don't think an officer has to assume that this person will um, at some future point uh, comply. And in fact, an officer, again, is entitled to use force under these national standards greater than the force or greater than to, to overcome the suspect's actions, agreed? Um, I, I, so I, I, I really don't like greater. Sometimes I hear that formulation, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, if someone is running away, what is force greater than running away? Uh, I would say that an officer has to use or, or can use force that is proportional and reasonable to address an individual's noncompliance or resistance, assuming, of course, that they have legal authority to do so. Right. And um, how it is frequently described in, in, in these materials that you've reviewed is that an officer can use more an, so a, a, an amount of force that is greater than the greater than the force being used by the suspect in an effort to overcome that resistance, right? Are, are you asking me about the MPD training material specifically? Yes. Objection, Your Honor, A reasonable officer is um, should should be <clears throat> permitted to rely on information that they receive from his or her partner officers. Correct? Uh, yes. And do you recall in reviewing the video after or as this uh, struggle was ensuing? Officer Chauvin asking if he was under arrest? Uh, I do, I believe that's um, either prior to or as they're taking him out of the vehicle, out of the police vehicle. And other officers confirmed that he was under arrest at that time, correct? Uh, yes, either Officer King or Officer Lane says, well, he's under arrest for forgery or again, something very similar to that. Right. And Mr. Floyd said forgery for what, right? Uh, yeah, something like that. And so in the context of this particular case, does 
a reasonable police officer decide if the person, if the suspect should be put into the squad car, or does the suspect decide whether they should be put into the squad car? Does the, does the, I mean, the officer determines that someone should be put into the squad, again, assuming that's, there's legal authority and the like. Right. And so, assuming that there's legal authority, the suspect does not get to dictate, do I get to sit on the ground or do I have to sit in a squad car? Agreed? Uh, to to um, some extent, uh, yes, absolutely. There is a, um, uh, yes. Now, as we watch through the, the clips that you selected, the clips that we watched were not chronological necessarily in their order, were they? Um, going in sort of top row and bottom row, each was chronological, right? The first clip happened first, the last clip happened last, and then we went back to, back to the beginning on the, on the bottom part, right, on the foreseeable effects discussion. Reasonable officer um, would also uh, presumably have some knowledge about his partners, correct? Um, I, you might need to define some knowledge, but they would certainly know some stuff about the, the other officers that they were interacting with at close proximity, yes. A reasonable officer may know that these other officers who were on scene were on their second or third day as police officers. Overall, I uh, it, it it depends what the officer knows at that point. If if those are facts and circumstances uh, that they are aware of, then a reasonable officer would be aware of it. Yes, it's entirely possible for an officer to not to, to, to work with an officer in the field that they don't know that they don't know how long they've been on the field. Now, you 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 testified on direct examination that a reasonable officer would, when they approached and saw what was happening with Mr. Floyd would know that, for example, that person had been searched, right? Um, I believe I said that it would certainly suggest that someone has been searched because you don't generally load someone into a vehicle before they had been searched. But you don't know if the search was, that reasonable officer would not necessarily know if the search was thorough, correct? Because they didn't see it. As you pointed out, officers are allowed to rely on the information that they get from other officers. Um, so while no, the officer is not in a position to gauge the, how thorough the, the particular search was, there is an element of relying on other officers to do the job they've been trained for. And also in terms of you don't know whether the vehicle that the person and or his occupants was in was searched. A reasonable officer wouldn't necessarily know that at that point. Um, Yes, that, that's correct. Without additional information, I don't know why a reasonable officer would know that a vehicle had or had not been searched or had or did not have occupants. But in fact, during the course of their interaction with Mr. Floyd, the officers did in fact discuss that Park, was over, Park Police was over with the occupants of the vehicle and that the vehicle hadn't been searched yet, right? At, at which point? As they had Mr. Floyd restrained. Um, I, I can't tell you exactly when that happened. I remember some discussion to that effect. So officers, you would agree they go through this process of reassessment, the reasonable police officer does, right? I certainly hope so, yes. And officers will get information that may change how to deal with a particular situation, right? Um, that may, uh, yes, as officers get additional information, they may update their response, escalating or de-escalating a use of force, for example, or talking to one person or not talking to one person that they had originally intended to speak to, sure. Now, in terms of, again, uh, the concept of situational awareness, an officer has to be around of his, uh, aware of his or her surroundings, agreed? Yes. And that would include things like, uh, being on a busy street, right? Uh, yes, tactically, that's why you don't want to prone someone out on a street when you have the option of not doing so. In terms of those tactics, however, when Mr. Floyd, so I want to make sure that we're very clear here, in your position, from your review of the reasonableness of the use of force, it was unreasonable for the officers to put Mr. Floyd in the prone position at all, period, correct? Yes, at that point, he did not present a threat to the officers 
or their interests. He did not present a threat of escape. The officers used some amount of force to put him into the car, and I have no issue with that. But putting him in the prone position, especially on the street side of the car, was unreasonable and excessive and contrary to generally accepted police practices. Reasonable minds can disagree, agreed? On this particular point, no. Okay, so Sergeant Steiger, who testified earlier, did you have an opportunity to review his testimony? I believe I, yes, I did. And so his assessment that it was reasonable for the officers to use the prone position in that time, at that time, you would disagree with him? I disagree. I think putting someone prone is unreasonable there. They are already handcuffed. The prone position is a transitory position used to restrain someone, handcuffs, or I suppose hobbles. In this case, officers took Mr. Floyd out of the car, put him on his knees, and then put him onto his side. And again, if they had stopped there, I would not have any quibble with their actions. Now, you testified that you described the prone position as transitory in nature. It is, yes, for 30 years or so, it's been generally accepted that that is a transitory position for the purposes of handcuffing or securing. Are there ever situations where officers would keep a person in the prone position longer than a transitory nature? There shouldn't be. Putting someone in the recovery position is literally a matter of rotating them 90 degrees onto their side. Officers can maintain as much or almost as much control over the individual. So while I suppose it's hypothetically possible, you know, if there's, I don't know, if gunfire breaks out and the officers are laying on someone to protect them with their body, maybe, but certainly not in this case. So in you, in your academic endeavors, you submitted a opinion piece to the Washington Post. Do you recall that? Specific to this case? I have, I don't know, close to 30 op-eds at this point. On May 29th of 2020, an article appeared in the Washington Post authored by Seth Stoughton. That's you, right? Stoughton, but yes. Stoughton, sorry. That's all right. Jeffrey Noble, that's the person you wrote the book with, right? Yes, one of the two individuals. And Jeffrey Alpert, right? The other co-author of the book, yes. And so you wrote, officers might need to hold someone down in the prone position, but they should do so by putting their shin across the subject's upper back, not the neck. Do you disagree with that? Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay? Overruled. Are you asking me if I wrote that? Correct. I did, yes, referring to handcuffing. Pressing on someone's neck risks damaging the cervical spine or breaking the hyoid bone, which can be fatal. Yes. And this was an opinion that you had formulated. Your opinion piece was from four days after this incident? That, yes, it was based on the review, as I think I write in the first or second paragraph of the opinion, the limited information that was available at that time. Right. And so at that point, it's fair to say that you had already formed the opinion based on that limited information that this was an unreasonable use of force. I think it's fair to say that I had formed the opinion that putting your knee across someone's neck, except in absolutely unbelievably rare circumstances, is generally an inappropriate use of force. This is an application of that generally accepted practice. Of course, as I reviewed all of the materials in this case, some of the opinions that I discussed at the bottom of that op-ed changed, and this was not one of them. The additional information confirmed that the knee across the neck was inappropriate and that the prone restraint was inappropriate. Was the knee, in your opinion, across the neck throughout the entire nine minutes and 29 seconds? From my perspective, that's irrelevant. The knee should never be on the neck. It was certainly on the neck for a majority of the time, even if it was moved off of the neck at certain points. Were you able to somehow determine the amount of pressure that was applied to Mr. Floyd's neck? Not with any specificity, of course. There are some indicators that it was a substantial amount of body weight, 
but I can't tell you exactly how many, pan, uh, how many pounds. For example, the positioning of uh, the defendant's hips forward and over the left leg, uh, the position of the defendant's shoulders as opposed to being back in sort of a squat position where you'd be resting on your feet, it was forward indicating more weight on the, on the front towards the knee. And at times it was to the right, correct? Um, yeah, I think his hips, uh, or, or not his hips, excuse me, um, his right shoulder dipped uh, at some point. Um, I, I'm unable to say what effect that had on the weight on his left knee. So let's go back to um, the period of time when the officers were uh, attempting to put Mr. Floyd into the squad car. Um, reasonable police officers, again, in assessing their use of force, have to take into consideration uh, the strength of the individual, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Based on the experience that they may just have had, right? Um, how much, how strong someone is, is a reflection of their physical ability to resist in different ways. So that is certainly a factor in that threat analysis. And you already testified that the officers, uh, a reasonable police officer, can take into account size differences. Agreed? Um, size differences, uh, number of officers versus number of subjects, physical characteristics, uh, age, you know. A, a, a 10 year old versus a 40 year old may possess, present a different threat or risk analysis. Agreed? Uh, yes, they have different levels of physical ability, the threat that they present or the severity of the threat they present, even in doing the same actions, right? A, 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 a healthy uh, college student and a, you know, a morbidly obese 90-year-old are not going to throw the same punch. Reasonable police officers do take into consideration uh, an expected, per, perhaps, EMS response, right? Um, in what context? Time. I, I, I'm sorry, in, in making which decision? I, I'm, yes, absolutely, reasonable police officer. I mean, when you call EMS, you expect EMS to respond. So certainly officers can act in reliance that EMS will respond when called. Right. And you understand that in this particular case, EMS was uh, called. At yes. The, at the, and that was contemporaneous to the point of the discussion about the use of the MRT, correct? Um, yes, I, I forget if that's when they were initially called or when they were upgraded, but it, yes, somewhere in there. And uh, again, a reasonable police officer in assessing the physical condition of the suspect, it would be reasonable for him to increase the response of EMS based on those observations, right? To, to uh, upgrade, to ask for a co lights and siren response, um, uh, yes, absolutely. What, what's not reasonable is hold. Objection non-responsive at that point. The answer is concluded at that point. A reasonable officer has to take into consideration um, his or her position relevant to other bystanders, right? I mean, meaning if I'm on my, if a police officer is on the knees, and there is a crowd of people that are standing above them, that's a consideration that a reasonable police officer would make. Depending on the situation, that can affect a concept that's referred to as reactionary gap. Um, it's one of many such factors in, the, in this totality of the circumstances. Um, so if there is some reason to believe that the crowd is threatening in some way, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, don't, I don't see that the case here. You've seen, uh, obviously, the, the footage, and at one point you observe Officer Chauvin uh, reach for his mace, correct? Yes. And shake it? Um, it? He takes it out of the holster, and I forget if he shakes it, but he definitely has it uh, deployed, yes. While saying to the crowd, don't come over here. Or something like that, yes. Reasonable police officer would know that they are being recorded, right, in this situation. Uh, I mean, the officers are wearing body cameras, so they should know that they are being recorded. And based upon your review, it appears that several people are standing right out in front of the officers holding what appear to be cell phones, correct? Oh, yes. And a reasonable police officer would be 
who is situationally aware would be aware that they are being recorded by the bystanders, right? I think that's a fair description depending on the positioning of the officers. Uh, I'm not sure a reasonable officer in Officer Lane's position that Mr. Floyd's feet would have been aware, but uh, in the defendant's position, yes. And you're um, familiar with the concept that sometimes situations may look awful, but they may be lawful. With, with the concept? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I suppose, I'm, I'm, can, you, can you explain what you mean there, please? Sure. Um, the police use of force is never a particularly attractive thing to, to watch or to witness. Uh, it's it's not very pretty. Um, I, yeah, I think that's often the case. Right. And just because it's not very pretty does not mean that it's not lawful use of force. Agreed? Um, yes, sure. A, a, an officer can act reasonably and consistent with generally uh, general excuse me generally accepted police practices, uh, and it can look bad. Um, I, as I said, I don't think that's the case here. Based on uh, the standards that you're aware of, um, prone control of a subject versus prone handcuffing, are those two different uh, police practices? I, there is a significant difference between um, the positioning and the techniques of getting someone into handcuffs and then the uh, techniques and tactics of maintaining control of someone once they've been handcuffed. So if, if that's what you're asking, yes, the, the actions that an officer takes while handcuffing someone are not necessarily justified after the individual has been handcuffed. You're um, aware of the general c concept of a use of force continuum, correct? Oh, yes. And that a use of force continuum uh, may include also what is called passive resistance, agreed? Uh, the resistance portion of a use of force continuum can include what we can call passive resistance, absolutely. And passive resistance uh, does not exclude the possibility of the use of force. Uh, that's correct. So to go back from, uh, excuse me, to go back to my uh, previous example, if you have someone who is, for example, um, protesting whatever happens on the other side of the driveway, the officer may use force to address that passive resistance to move that person, sure. Again, there has to be a threat that they're addressing with that passive resistance. So in terms of the, uh, at the point Mr. Floyd is placed prone on the ground, you observe, do you observe him continue to uh, kick his back legs? Are you, are you talking about as he, as he is brought down to the ground? Yep, initially. So there's one movement, one movement that's captured on, I believe, Officer King's and Officer Tao's body cameras uh, that looks to me as if Officer Lane is grabbing Mr. Floyd's leg and pulling it and straightening it and rotating it. Um, it's, I, that is my interpretation of what is happening there. And in fact, at that particular point, Officer Lane says something to the effect of Jesus Christ. Um, I don't remember if it's at that particular point. Uh, yes, it, it, it's not clear to me what he's referring to. He later um, makes some comments about what appear to be the smell of Mr. Floyd's feet, so I'm, I'm not sure what he's responding to when he says that. So you did not observe him attempt to control Mr. Floyd's legs at that particular point? Oh, no, he was definitely controlling Mr. Floyd's legs at that point. Um, when, they bring, when the officers bring Mr. Floyd from his knees onto his side, uh, and then uh, from his side into that prone position, that grabbing and what I see as um, pulling the leg is part of controlling the leg to flip his Mr. Floyd's hip and put him into that prone position, at which point uh, Officer Lane kneels over and then later holds Mr. Floyd's leg. So yeah, he was definitely controlling his legs. Now, you would agree that a reasonable police officer has to assess multiple situations simultaneously, agreed? Um, I, uh, no, I, a, a reasonable officer has to assess the situation that they're in, 
Um, certainly there are simultaneous inputs to that, but they're, they're in the situation that they should be focused on. So an, a reasonable officer who's in a situation where uh, they've just struggled with, three officers have just struggled with an individual, they're going to have some sense of exhaustion themselves, agreed? Um, it, depending on the length of the struggle and their efforts in the struggle, um, in, in this case it was relatively abbreviated. They would have to take into consideration the changing circumstances throughout the, the use of force, agreed? Absolutely, they need to take into account changing circumstances. And you were shown some footage of the crowd uh, that was present uh, or that formed initially was a relatively small crowd, agreed? Um, yes, I, I, I mean personally I wouldn't describe it as a crowd, it was like 12 to 15 people including folks over by the bus stop, so uh, some, a, a group of bystanders. People uh, across the street as well, right? Um, there was at least one person filming from across the street. Um, I don't remember seeing many, um, many bystanders on the other bystanders' cameras. Okay. Um, you agree that the camera only captures what the lens captures, right? It, any individual camera? Yes, any individual camera will only capture what's on camera. And so, for example, that city pole camera, the milestone camera, you can see other individuals standing, more than one individual standing on the sidewalk across the street from where the officers were positioned. Agreed? Yes, at times, yes. And at various points you would agree that there were people uh, across the street to the southwest, southeast, excuse me. The, is that, um, is that the, the Dragon Walk restaurant? Correct. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, yes, I believe the, the uh, park police officer remained over in that way, in that direction. With you know to be two other passengers who were in the vehicle, at least, correct? Uh, I do, yes. And also, I know that, and then, but they're standing there. So officers who are in the scene, a reasonable officer, is assessing not just what's in front of him in terms of the subject, but they're assessing, does this group of people present a threat or a risk to me? Uh, yeah, that's the basics of situational awareness, right? Knowing, not getting so focused on one particular thing that you lose awareness of the broader situation, the context in which you're asking, uh, acting, excuse me. Yep. And, and a, again, a reasonable officer in terms of situational awareness will try to be aware of what's behind him, agreed? Yes. Or to his right or left. The, right? the, the surrounding situations, yes. And uh, reasonable officers um, can be distracted by those types of things. Um, so depending on what those other stimuli are, uh, yes. In this case, the first, again, more than three and a half minutes, there, there's no criticism from any bystanders. There's um, either silent bystanders or, in the case of Mr. McMillan, bystanders who are urging Mr. Floyd to comply with the officers. There was also radio traffic, agreed? Uh, some amount of radio traffic, yes. Confirming at one point at least that EMS was in route, code three. Uh, yes, that was um, I think relatively late in the, in the interaction, but yes. Or confirming that they were at a particular location. It was at the particular time. We watched a couple of seconds as they were discussing uh, whether Mr. Floyd was using some sort of controlled substances. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so yes, I do. A reasonable officer has to take into consideration, as you testified, that the suspect may be under the influence of a controlled substance, right? Absolutely. And a reasonable officer, based on uh, nationally accepted standards, you testified has a duty of care in that particular situation, right? Um, in the situation where someone is potentially under the influence of controlled substances? Yeah. Yes. So my testimony was an officer certainly has a duty to render medical aid as appropriate. Uh, just because someone might be on drugs doesn't necessarily create a medical situation, but it certainly affects their susceptibility to positional asphyxia, which officers should take into account. And a reasonable police officer in terms of his or her belief that someone may be under the control, influence of a controlled substance 
can take into account that that person may um, be stronger than they would normally? Uh, in terms of assessing the potential uh, physical ability of the individual, yes, that of course doesn't play into the opportunity or the apparent intention prong of threat. You would agree that reasonable police officers should have a higher level of awareness than non-law enforcement officers? I think the nature of the job um, makes that a really good idea, yes. When you take into account uh, the reasonableness of the use of force, you would agree that you're not experiencing, actually experiencing what the off officers felt at that point, right? That I individually am not experiencing it? No, I am, I am applying the reasonable officer on the scene framework. I am not, in fact, there. Right, and so you're not, you don't have the same sensory responses to what the suspect or the officers are doing, right? You would not know, for example, is this person tensing his or her muscles because you're not feeling or touching that person. Yeah, so tactile feedback is one of the things that may not show up on video. Uh, it might, but it, it does not always show up on video. That's correct. <clears throat> when you do your um, use of force analysis, you're not doing it in a dangerous environment, I presume. Um, without any, making any jokes about my kids, no, I am, I'm not generally doing it in a, an extant dangerous situation. You have the luxury of slow motion enhancements, looking at things from multiple perspectives, agreed? Objective argumentative. Overall. So for the portion of the, in, uh, of the inquiry where am I, excuse me, for the portion of the inquiry where I'm identifying what the underlying facts were, uh, yes, I can slow video down, I can freeze frame it. Um, as I am taking those facts and circumstances and identifying what a reasonable officer would have perceived in that situation, I'm of course aware that a reasonable officer on the scene does not have those capabilities. Now you also described repeatedly um, seeing what you believed to be Mr. Chauvin's knee on the neck of Mr. Floyd. And you described that as deadly force, agreed? Yes. And you're trained in prone handcuffing and prone control yourself, correct? I, uh, yes, I suppose. And in terms of uh, an officer's training to use prone control, as you describe in the Washington Post article, the knee should be in the back between the trapezius muscles, agreed? Uh, trapezius, shoulder blade, tricep area, lat, uh, the big muscle under here, um, yes. And that would not be considered the use of deadly force, agreed? Uh, if, if, again, kept uh, transitory so that we aren't turning that into a prolonged prone restraint, uh, then no, that would not be considered deadly force. Reasonable police officer based on uh, national training standards um, would take into consideration the prospect that a person who fights with them and then appears to be compliant could potentially become a threat again. So what you're describing is risk, right? The idea of they could potentially become a threat, that, that's the very definition of risk. Um, Yes, and officers can do a range of things to mitigate risk and to prevent it from becoming for uh, to from, to prevent it from becoming a threat. They can't use force to address risk, but they can use some degree of force to deal with passive resistance. Um, yes, they can use some degree of force to address passive resistance. Uh, passive resistance does not present, of course, a threat of. Uh, escape or harm to the officers um, and it's the type of situation where if someone is passively resisting while officers are just trying to maintain control over them then you just hold them on their side. And in terms of um, a person who's handcuffed it's not a reasonable officer would never expect that person to get up and run away or become a threat again? 
Uh, that's not my testimony. My testimony is there may be some risk of that, but officers can generally maintain control over a handcuffed individual in the side recovery position, which is what it's designed for. You also watched one of the clips um, where one of the officers checked for a pulse, correct? Yes. And, and you heard Officer Chauvin say, huh? Uh, uh, yes. And then the response was, I'm just looking for a pulse? I, I, it was something like that. I said I was checking for a pulse or said I was looking for a pulse or something like that. At the point that the officer references, we didn't watch the entirety of it during this clip, but at the point the officer references that he was passing out, you also hear officers say, but he's still breathing. Yes. At that point, he was still breathing. Or at least the officers are narrating that he was still breathing at that point. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, you were asked some questions, and I'd like you to provide some further explanation regarding using uh, more force than the subject presents. Right? And I believe you were asked if the officer was allowed to use sort of a level up of force. Um, is that an uh, oversimplification of the reasonableness standard? Y yes, it is, and it, it's an oversimplification that really doesn't make a, a lot of sense, right? Um, like I said, what does it mean to use a level up from passive resistance or someone running away? You, you know, running faster doesn't count. Um, so I, I, I don't find that to be a helpful formulation of explaining uh, proportionality and reasonableness. And you also testified as to the need for officers to reassess the situation on cross-examination. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Be situationally aware of changes in circumstances. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And that you know some officer may need to be aware um, who's behind them across the street at some point. Is that right? Uh, sure, officers should should maintain that level of situational awareness. But should a reasonable officer maintain a level of situation awareness as to what's going on right in front of them? Absolutely, that's still the primary focus. Situational awareness is. Um, not exclusively focusing on what you're dealing with right in front of you, but it's also not ignoring what you're dealing with and that's right in front of you. And with respect to tactile response, that's feeling the response of someone uh, who you're touching, is that right? That's correct. So someone who's, um, you know, you, you can't just tell looking whether I'm pushing on my own hand. Um, so yes, that's correct. Would a reasonable officer in the place of the defendant then have the situational awareness to understand that he's kneeling on top of a limp person who is not responsive? Um, I would certainly have hoped so, yes. A reasonable officer would absolutely be aware of that. And in terms of situational awareness and relying on information provided from partner officers, would a reasonable officer in the defendant's situation have paid attention when the comment that they couldn't find a pulse was made? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's an incredibly important uh, important piece of information for a, an officer there, as is um, the, the 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 moving uh, of the of the individual. Um, one of the things that we know about positional asphyxia is this concept of vicious cycle, which is that as someone starts to have difficulty breathing, they move or um, or or resist, if you like, for breath. They're fighting to breathe, not fighting officers. Um, and again, this goes back almost 30 years as generally accepted uh, with regard to positional asphyxia and the, the, the way officers should address it. In terms of rendering medical aid and the decision of an officer to believe if someone is stating something like, for example, I can't breathe, shouldn't the officer using situational awareness determine um, the uh, credibility of that statement based on all the facts and circumstances presented at the time. Uh, yes, and again, the officer has a very limited ability to engage in credibility determinations there. Um, so if someone is expressing difficulty breathing, you roll them onto their side so it's easier for them to breathe. That is what the side recovery position was intended for. One hypothetical situation is that a person standing in the distance from me to you speaking in the tone 
that I'm speaking, expressing to you that I can't breathe, you might have a reason to doubt that based on all of the facts and circumstances, correct? Uh, sure, under our, uh, uh, yes, under, under our interactions, um, there, there's no reason to believe that that's the case. There's no uh, behavioral indications. We're continuing to have the same conversation. As the officer, I would still want to take that seriously and potentially summon medical aid, uh, but we're not in the position of me you know, knocking you down and doing CPR or anything. But if you're kneeling on top of me and I'm telling you that you can't breathe, that might be a different situation and your situational awareness might prompt you to believe that in fact, what I'm saying is what I'm actually experiencing. What would the situation be? Well, never mind. I have no further questions. Any further recross? Thank you, sir. You are excused. Thank you. Members of the jury, uh, we will be taking our adjournment for the day, but I wanted to give you an idea of a little bit of time frame now that we're getting closer to the end. We expect that we'll be moving to the defense case tomorrow, and accordingly, we expect that we'll finish all the evidence in this case uh, by the end of the week, possibly with even Friday off. Uh, my preference is not to make the attorneys close on Friday because when they close, this case will be submitted to you for deliberation which means at that time, as we warned you long ago in jury selection, you'll be sequestered. Uh, if I were to have closing arguments on Friday, that would mean you'd be sequestered in your weekend, uh, and I don't know if you have any plans. I'm not gonna do that. Um, my preference is to give the attorneys more time to prepare their closing arguments uh, and have the closing arguments we predict on Monday. At that point, you will be sequestered. So uh, you'll get some more information from the sheriff's deputies uh, regarding that, but expect that you will, uh, when you report for your duty on Monday, that it will be followed by sequestration. So, pack a bag. Uh, but the deputies will give you a little more information. Just wanted to kind of give you that so you can plan your own lives around that. And we will see you tomorrow about 9.15. Thank you. We're in recess.